guys are talking about something. Go ahead. If you want to queue We're up that one video, eight minutes and 38 seconds is the is one of the more complicated interactions if you're just looking okay. like where to go. But if you're just going to show the title of it, we could talk to that too. Okay, perfect. 838, that's fine too. Hello, everybody. We're live. Can you hear us? Can you see us? Welcome from the internet. Ha ha. Uh, let us know where you're from in the comments. Uh, drop your location if you want, if you feel comfortable. I'm not going to come and hunt you down. We have James Dama. We have Chuck Cook. If you're part of the Tesla community, you know these gentlemen very well. Um, both uh, gentlemen have uh, uh, 10.69 in their cars. And of course, both gentlemen have been uh, uh, very helpful in helping the Tesla community understand uh, the state of FSD, where it's going to go in the future. Obviously, Chuck has had a uh, software release named after him, which I, I can't even imagine how cool that is. And James obviously has just just blew our brains with the amount of knowledge he has from an AI perspective. And having these two guys in the same um, in room, virtual room with me, it's a great honor for me. So I really appreciate you guys uh, agreeing to this discussion. So thank you both very much for, for joining me. me today. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah, of course. Awesome. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, Chuck, uh, what was it? 838 was the timestamp. I'll pull that up. But in the meantime, if you want to yeah. talk about the yeah. video that you dropped today, um, we'll for, first of all, for everyone that watches my videos, you know I bang out these uh, unprotected left turns. And it's not necessarily because I love doing them. It's because everybody loves watching them. And oh, by the way, they're very different every single time because we're driving these cars in an unconstrained operational domain with other vehicles that are always different every time. Uh, but today I released uh, one because honestly, because a few viewers were like, hey, we hadn't seen a, a copy of your uh, unprotected left turns on this build yet. And we're getting ready to get another build this uh, week. Like um, Elon mentioned, we're expecting dot two at the end of the week, if that holds true. So I did this uh, drive today and, you know, my very first video on 69.0 was amazing. It was unbelievable actually. And you can say it was the day, the whatever, I, who knows, we can go down the whole AB testing scenario, which I'm not necessarily sure is happening, but when you describe different interactions, every single one is unique. You can't sit there and, and stack them up and say, uh, you know, this is following that one and that one's following this one because I think they're all unique. But today I was about 50-50. So it wasn't great, but there were some of them that were fine, just fine. And they were fine because Tesla in 69 has introduced two functions that really help it do better. They instituted a creep limit wall or whatever you want to call it where and it may not be new but they're visualizing it to me how far they're calculating the car can go based on an extension of the drivable space and then they introduced a new median projection network maybe james could come up with the right word of what is a drivable space that it can go to and then to get there they've introduced a little right turn and a little left turn that they're calling a pose in the release notes that allows it to enter the traffic at a better angle and also fit in a tight median. So it all kind of works as a two part problem rather than a one part problem that it was doing before this build. So anyway, take a look at the video if you're interested in it, uh, throw some comments in there, but it was, uh, it was an exciting day, that's for sure. <laughs> So I have it up here. So if you're not familiar with Chuck's channel, Chuck Cook, uh, the latest one is FSD beta version 10.69.1.1. Um, Chuck, you had me queue up a specific timestamp uh, yeah. related to the specific release. Uh, what it was 838, I want to confirm, correct? Yeah, it was 838. And and okay. I don't know if we're going to watch this together live or not, but this one was one because I don't understand why it did what it did. Uh, I'm going to throw on my glasses just so I can look more closely with you. But it, it made a decision to go. And it went into the first lane and waited, which some people would say it shouldn't do that. But then if you look very carefully, it committed and look at the drone view too, right? Boom. And I had to disengage as it went right towards that car. And it had a seven and a half mile an hour speed when I disengaged when the car was before. And I was like, man, if that had been a Tesla, it had gone on automatic emergency braking because I was moving and there, now, you might say it was programmed perfectly to cross behind, and I can't do that mental math accurately enough to know. And if we're in a zero tolerance world, that's fine, but there's no doubt that that car was a little too close for my comfort, so I disengaged. Mm -hmm. And I imagine if that other driver, I, I, I don't know what that other driver was feeling that day. So this was one that I'm like, I don't understand why all the other times it's so cautious. And in this one, it wasn't. I don't. You're talking see about this here. car right here, right? This right red there. car. Okay. Um, okay. So anyway, I don't know. Maybe James can look at it. Just you know, I know you said you watched it, but I don't know if you've analyzed it. 
Oh, um, yeah. It's I looked at this turn the and the there's another one at uh, eleven I think it was eleven fifteen that yeah. I thought was interesting too. It was the one where you know you complete you, the pickup truck was passing behind you and you weren't sure if your butt was sticking out kind of thing. So yeah. I thought both of those were. I mean, you you had several interesting turns here. This that this one where you're approaching the car. Uh, so sometimes the behavior is just a bug, right? Yeah. So, not, yeah. so it's not like I look at this and I know for sure what's going on inside the head of, of the car. I do tend to look at this stuff a little differently than, than people who haven't spent a lot of time thinking about how the system works. I look for different cues. And so sometimes I come up with different, different poses. When I look at that video, it looks to me like there's a decent amount of space. Like if you're a machine and you know, mm -hmm. When, uh, so I mostly drive the, uh, uh, the beta in, uh, I have a Model S Plaid and I really like that car and it doesn't have any scratches and it doesn't have any rim rash. It's perfect, right? So you can imagine that I can get very, very uncomfortable when it gets really close to cars. And I'm having yeah. to learn to trust the car because FSD in that car is super comfortable with driving like within 12 inches of other cars when it's fitting through gaps and stuff like mm. that. And I am super not comfortable with that. And it, it has taken time for me to get to a point to understand that it can see those gaps on the side of the car. It can see them much better than I can because it's got cameras there. Whereas I'm sitting in the driver's seat and I'm kind of guessing how much space there is on the passenger side and I want it to err on the large side. So uh, you know, I'm gradually getting comfortable with letting with with how it does that. And I gradually trust it more over time. Right. And yeah. the thing is, the machine is really good at those kinds of estimates because machines, they can do a calculation and say, you know, that car is going to pass in front of me in three point two seconds. And it is going to take me three point, you know, uh, six seconds to close that gap or whatnot. Whereas as a human being, you're kind of eyeballing stuff and you yeah. we naturally want to have a lot of margin when our uncertain when where we have less certainty so yeah you know my experience with the thing is you you, you that's why i like that comment that you said about how you know <laughs> you get used to it you, you want to be able to trust it but not yeah. today when you yeah. see these you drive test vehicles you drive test software you see it mess up a lot and you very appropriately don't trust it <laughs> right yeah. because it does make mistakes so <laughs> I, I can look at that video and externally, like I'm not, I can't tell exactly at what point from the external view where you intervened mm -hmm. and how the velocity profile of the vehicle checked. It looks to me on that video that, that it, that it was, it had space, but it, I think it would have been one of those things. It might've been one of those things where, you know, it was going to have 18 inches of gap at the point that it passed and you guys are moving at a relative velocity of like 40 miles an hour. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's not comfortable for people. So I so totally these, like, I would have stopped there too. The two things that, that, that make me, I'm really thinking about this hard because it's so fascinating. Farzad, see if you can get to the last frame where the trajectory is blue, because that is where I disengaged. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's blue committing. And if you can see my speeds and I've got an accelerometer on there, I'm, I'm going mm -hmm. seven miles an hour right now with a blue vector. Right. And the car, it, it's going in, you know, it's, it's still to the left of me. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, okay, if I was in that car in a Tesla, I, you know, you know, I see cars cross all the time from me. It would have gone, Arr! that's what the Tesla would have done, at least oh, on FSD yeah. beta. Okay. Sure. A human might not have. Um, and the second thing I'm thinking about is I know how this car right now goes into that median. And if it uh -huh. did try to go in front of it, it kind of creeps into the median. So what it would have done is gone in front and then slowed down to get into the median. It wouldn't have gone real quick into the median. Now, you might be theorizing it was going to go behind the car. And if you think it was going to go behind the car, when you look at that trajectory right there that we have it frozen on, that's not what I perceived uh, with a seven right. mile an hour forward oh, vector at the moment. Yeah, I looked at that whole interaction and it seemed to me that the car was intending to do that thing where where you're pre-positioning yourself because you don't have much time, but you're going to wait for it to go and then and then use the fact that you're already moving and you're well across the road to like get into the median because you, you yeah. can't enter the median at high speed. You've got to right. slow to a stop there. And, yeah. you know, one of the things that they have a jerk limit on the on mm. how they let the car manipulate the accelerator. And I think it's not super obvious that a, a, the jerk limit, it really constrains 
what the trajectories that they can choose to drive with. So when it mm. makes a plan, it has to have a plan where it doesn't exceed the jerk limit anywhere inside that plan. Yeah. Um, and like you had some, um, here's an, if a human being's driving, right? Like if you yourself are driving and you, you can be creeping out and you know that you intend to slow down and stop, or you know that you intend to accelerate and proceed, but you know, we're humans and we're monitoring the mm -hmm. car and we're not sure if it's misjudging the speed because we don't know what it intends to do, right? So we're not really prepared. And even if you're paying attention, it takes 200 milliseconds to respond just to notice that something's going wrong and another 100 or 200 milliseconds to stop it. So we have to manage the car with this buffer. But when yeah. people drive themselves, they drive with very, can, they can drive with very small margins and they're comfortable doing that. But, you know, with the overhead of the car and, you know, so I, I definitely have seen the car make mistakes. Like it definitely makes mistakes. I don't want to suggest that that it doesn't. But mm -hmm. I think there are also lots of times where it looks like it's going to be a mistake, uh, and because we're misunderstanding the intention of the car. You know, I mean, yeah. the whole reason that they give us this display in the car with the blue ones and the red ones and, you know, the For indicators us. and stuff is to try to give you a sense of what yeah. the car's thinking and what it's trying to do. In fact, Elon called it the mind of the, what is it? Mind of mind car. of the car. The right. Mind, mind, right. So that you could get a sense of what was going on that would, it would make it more, uh, you would be a better manager because you have a sense of what the car is doing. In fact, that little, you know, when you pull up to your turn and they 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 blue color code that stopping zone in the median, now you know it's planning a two-step maneuver, right? Like mm -hmm. if you're expecting a one-step maneuver and it hops out there and you see cars <laughs> coming from the right or a two-step, like your reaction is really different to that. Yeah. And also yeah. that the thing where they have the creep limit, the light blue line, I think that's actually pretty brilliant too. Like it didn't occur to me, but you know, if the car is like, okay, this is as far as I'm willing to go. And it puts that line out there. Now you as a driver, you just know looking at that, okay, this is its limit. If it crosses that line, it's going. If it doesn't yeah. cross that line, until it crosses that line, it hasn't decided to go. So you, you know, and you, you sort of prepare yourself in different ways to intervene if you need to, depending on what that is. So, but coming yeah. up with those really clever ways to just intuit, put something on the display that's really intuitive to a human that's like, oh, that's what it's doing. That's what it's thinking. I, I think that's hard. They, they, yeah. I feel like they've done a pretty good job. I feel like they could add a lot more data to it. But, you know, as a pilot, you know, this whole thing about like, you can only process so much information. Right? Yeah. You, 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 there, and, uh, and, you know, and with drivers and cars, that's a, a really big problem too. They're not professionals. They're not practicing doing this. They're just yeah. doing it. And a lot of people are asking for a chime for a commit. And, and I, I understand all these needs, but I, I also get the, that Ashok's team has probably got this design philosophy of, listen, we're building this to not need you. We're not going to spend all yeah. this time creating yeah. these things. This for is all you, stuff, yeah. Right. You know, so these are pacification type of uh, additions to the, the UI. And I get right. that. And I understand that. Believe me, but it helps at this point. One of the fascinating things that I love to watch about this new creep limit is how when I don't have a square road like this one, and there's a couple at the end of the video, if you could find them, Farzad, yeah, where it's a that. curved intersection. And it, it, you can, I love to watch that creep limit jump mm -hmm. around and, mm -hmm. and to try to think about, wow, that actually makes sense why sometimes it goes way too far out. I'm like, maybe that was one of those times right. where the creep limit wall was too far out that time. Um, and, well, you know, well, and then you. So ahead. something to think about on that creep limit line, right? The way they draw the creep limit line, I mean, it doesn't always do this, but frequently, the stuff in the display gives you a sense of how they're writing the rules to make decisions, right? So you only, like I've only ever seen the straight creep limit line, right? So it that kind of suggests that the way they're thinking about the creep limit is they're drawing a straight line between two points at an intersection to make a decision. As a human, you go to a thing and if the road is curved, you might think of the creep limit as curved, but right. they're not doing that right now. And yeah. so like one obvious fix is, well, they could have curved creep limits and maybe they add that at some point, you know, but yeah. maybe it's a complication they don't want to deal with right now. Maybe they think it'll work well enough without it, yeah. but it gives us a clue about like wh why it's failing when it's failing too. That And I love the fact that it came and it went like in the display when you when you had the curve thing 
because that suggests like as a driver, you're looking at that and you're like, because there's some intersections where it doesn't have, a, it can't come up with a good creep limit. And so yeah. you would expect its behavior to be like, maybe it feels like it just can't creep at that intersection because it's not sure where the traffic lane is, right? Yeah. Hey, I want to give a shout out to Matthew Driver on Twitter, just because I have the opportunity and I, I don't know as far as that, how many people we have watching. I'd like to make a shout out when there's the most people. Right now, yeah. Oh, great. So yeah. if you look at my display, there's a lot going on and there's something for everybody. And, and just so you know, this isn't stock. But what I want to call your attention to are those two blue uh, things just to the right of the speed limit. Uh, and Matthew Driver on Twitter helped me create these. They're his design work, but I, I put the data behind them. Um, that one on the left is a 3D accelerometer, forward, lateral, and vertical acceleration in real time with the car. That helps you see speed bumps, or if I go with the railroad tracks, that dot gets really big in the vertical. And if I'm accelerating or decelerating, it kind of gives you that visualization. Mm. The one oh, to the yeah, right. Nice. I hadn't noticed the vertical dimension. That's yeah. Really cool. The one to the right is kind of a duplicate of the steering wheel that you have in the tiny one in the upper left, where it shows you the actual steering wheel angle. But more importantly, we've overlaid the tire angle that we never had intuition to before. Oh, so you yeah. can say, oh, wait, my tires. And there's a ratio to steering wheel angle to tire angle that we're portraying there. So you can actually see where the tires mm -hmm. are pointing now, which uh, is very insightful for some people. to. So you're pulling all that out. stuff off of the car network and then yeah, just the can buses. I have two can yeah. buses, the uh, the chassis and the um, uh, they're, they're two buses I'm tapping into in two different locations, aggregating them together, extracting the data, doing a green screen overlay. And that top black bar is all the same sort of data with a little bit more number based type visualizations. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, the reason I mentioned that is because when you really watch these videos frame by frame, there's a lot of other data, like a really good one for knowing the creep is look at that torque, uh, the, the uh, torque um, speed in the middle of the black bar. You can see actual torque and when it's applied and when it stops. You see mm -hmm. right there in the upper mm -hmm. middle torque actual? Yeah, see it. And uh, there was one of these scenarios where the car did two little creeps and then it stopped on each one. And I was kind of talking in real time going, ooh, I thought it was gonna go and then it stopped. Oh, and it started to go again and then it stopped. And I looked exactly at the torque and I could see the torque going on and off in both of those scenarios. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was because it got visibility of something it didn't see or something else, but that lets us at least pick apart from an empirical view from the outside of, of what the car is doing with the sensors and the controls. Um, don't really know what the AI is doing. We have to guess at that with James's help, but you know, we can try to figure it out. A lot of this is rule-based too, right? And in fact, one of the things that's nice about, as I mentioned, you know, that now they're showing you these two zones, these two blue lines or, or whatnot. And, and it, it gives you, very much the sense that you know they're writing a set of rules for how they're going to deal with intersections, and then and those rules have to adapt to every intersection that you come to, and and when you get to a weird enough intersection, the rules break, or at least they they don't behave very well. And so having these, as soon as they start adding that blue zone in the middle, you know they've added driving logic for do half the road and then do yeah. the other half, right? Yeah. I mean that you know they somebody looked at this and said, okay, we're going to have to add extra rules so that we can do that stop in the middle. And, uh, you, you know, then once you once you start writing those rules, then naturally some of these visualizations can fall out of it. And, and then, and, and so that gives you an opportunity to convey to the driver, okay, we're switching from that set of rules, the go straight through the intersection rules to the stop in the middle of this intersection rules. And as a driver, yeah. you learn what to expect for those different things. And maybe even more importantly, you learn when it's when like what it's doing isn't fitting the right pattern. So you can intervene intention, uh, you know, intelligently and safely. Mm. I want to go back to a comment you made earlier to, to, to ask you for some more insight. You said it's got some uh, some jerk limits and some profiles that it's going mm. to live inside of. And one of the things I think of is like, OK, it's going to go. And once it's going, I don't know if it's going to stop and then go again. Do you sure. think it ever starts going with an intent to slow down and then continue? Or do you think that is an adjustment to an initial profile that it had to recalculate? I, it's, I, th I think the rules are probably got some layers to them. There are mm. definitely going to be situations where you start going and the right decision is stop now. Like the, the right decision a minute ago was go, but things have changed. Like imagine okay. that you know, you're, you're crossing three lanes and then a car changes lanes and you, you were assuming it was going to stay in the same lane. And so now, you know, what you want to do might need to change and the rules need to be 
flexible enough that they can deal with that kind of situation. So from a behavior standpoint, you're definitely going to see situations where, you know, where, uh, you know, I mean, if you were going to try to sit down and write out every possible scenario, there might be a hundred different scenarios, even though there's only three or four rules, but how the rules interact with one another. Uh, but uh, cause I've seen the same thing, I've seen it move, move up and stop. I, I've seen it move into a lane of traffic and slow down at a point when it really didn't make sense to slow down at this at that point. And it's probably responding to something that I think is inconsequential, but that its rules tell it or things it has to yeah. do. On left turns, that slowdown is usually for me, it sees something from the right and it's working on the second half of the problem and it's kind of pausing the first half of the mm. problem and it's kind of like adjusting its vector, even though it's no longer safe to stay where it is. And sometimes that's happened. This median logic helped that a lot because it got over and then it waited again and it continued mm -hmm. on. Um, I, I have, yeah. you know, I've been watching you like work through this, the, this turn for <laughs> a long time. And if somebody had asked me prior to this last version coming out, I would have said, yeah, I don't see Tesla trying to solve that. like <laughs> that stop in the median. Cause I looked at that thing. Well, and I've, you know, I've said a couple of times before, like I wouldn't do that left turn myself. Mm. <laughs> right. It's just like, I would go down a block or whatever the deal is. Cause it's scary to me. Now you live there, you drive it all the day. You know, it might be a totally typical left turn. People are used to them and they know the medians are big enough. And the other, you know that the other drivers know this is what you're going to do and they're going to expect it. But we don't have those kinds of left turns where I live and it just looks scary yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, I've shared a picture on Twitter a few times because people were like, well, just go down to the light. And I'm like, well, if you look mm -hmm. at my neighborhood, there's like eight unprotected lefts and one light. And a lot of people are like, well, how many accidents do you have at that intersection? And James, I think I've told you this before. Uh, mm -hmm. There's fewer accidents to that unprotected left than at the light. And at the light, because yeah. The, because the li drivers are aware in making the turn. But at the light, you kind of mm -hmm. go because the light's green. And if somebody's tweeting or doing something on their phone and they run the red light, yeah. that's where the fatalities yeah. have always happened. There's this the light. really interesting um, urban road design thing, which is very counterintuitive, which they've, they've found that if, you know, Ideally, you want big wide, you know, from a driver's standpoint, what seems safe is when the roads are big and wide and you've got really great visibility. And they find that in, in some places, traffic engineers, they go and they make the road narrower so you can't see as well. And the accident rate plummets hmm. because people behave differently when they don't feel like they've got a lot of margin, right? So you can imagine people approaching the intersection, like not paying attention, but as soon as they get away from the intersection, it's like, well, somebody might turn in front of me, you know, yeah. so I have to pay attention. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I wow. wonder how much uh, FSD's adoption in the medium term, or if mm -hmm. autonomy does kick off, how much of road design will change because of that? Or do you think that that, like, I'm curious, like, would that change once all drivers are off the road? Or do we start seeing some inkling of that? I, or, or will there need to be a, a change in road design once autonomy? I, takes I don't over, think you know? you'll see the road system change in response to autonomous. Car. I mean, you could imagine some downtown areas, they might make special lanes for autonomous cars or special parking spots or that kind of yeah. stuff. But um, the, you know, humans are going to keep needing the road system to be more or less the way that it is for a long time. As, as, as you get more autonomy, traffic patterns will change. You, you know, if you have, it doesn't take very many cars acting a certain way to try to change the way the whole group works. Like all, the whole, you know, the traffic flow will just change. And so there might be some, you know, second order responses to that kind of stuff that we end up seeing, but uh, the cars will be, way superhuman before we get all the humans out of the cars, right? So, you know, for most of the time, the cars are going to have to deal with the fact that there are lots of humans. And by the time they don't have to deal with that, they'll be so good that you, that no matter what you do with the roads, they'll be fine. Yeah. I imagine it's a pretty standard adoption curve for any type of technology you could probably follow and say this will be similar. Um, you know, th there's an interesting point to this about the, the humans, and the autonomy taking over that I'd like to get your opinion on James and Farzad. A lot of people are like, well, Tesla doesn't want to sell cars to consumers once they have autonomy because it's so profitable that they want to make them all robo taxis. And I'm like, is that what Elon is saying when he's going to go to 20 million car production with the 12 gigafactories? Is, is that plan for 20 million robo taxis or is that plan consumer level and the weaving in a robo taxi. I truly think that this is to sell to 20 million consumers, but a percentage of robo, obviously. But I, I really don't think 
that Elon is trying to kick us out of our cars in the time frame we're talking about through 2030. Yeah, I have a long-standing bet with a good friend about the whole adoption <laughs> thing. He re he really believes that that it just like once you have good robo taxi, it doesn't make sense to like sell cars to people anymore. Just sell all the cars, make all the cars robo taxi. Is it Yaman? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, you know, it, I mean, it's a, from an economic standpoint that, you know, for, there's a certain very sim simple way of looking at the thing where that makes sense. But I think the world is complicated and we don't and, and that we don't see that. Happen. The other thing is the fleet replacement. Like even if you even if all the cars you start you make right now are EVs or robo cars or whatnot, it takes a while. You know, the I mean, we can't have a cell phone like penetration for cars because cars last 20 years and you know it's just it's going to take two decades for the fleet to turn over even if you're working as, as hard as you can and so you know there's there's we're gonna there's going to be all of these intervening intermediate mm -hmm. stages that, that you have to get through i yeah. i you know I, at working the, the 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 business model like trying to ask the question like what makes the most sense for for tesla to do, I think I can make a pretty good argument that they don't want to stop, to entirely stop uh, consumer sales. Um, but you know, the, it, there's there's this window of time during the robo taxi adoption thing. Like once it starts working and you can start pushing them out, uh, you you get this window of time where it makes a lot more sense to push a robo taxi out the door than to push a consumer vehicle. But in the end right? The consumer is the marginal purchase. Like you, you get this window in the middle where there just aren't enough robo taxis and the robo taxi demand is really high. And so there's a lot of incentive. And, and in the middle, that's when the robo taxis are most valuable. Like at the end of the game, robo taxis aren't that valuable because they're commoditized because there's lots and lots of them. And they're driving, you know, because there's so many of them, you're only paying 20 cents a mile <laughs> to ride around in them. You know, the profit margins will come mm -hmm. down. So robo taxi unit profitability is going to it's going to start low because they're not going to be good. Then they're going to get good and there's going to be enough of them out there to get enough penetration, make the service good. And you're going to see that the, the adoption is going to go way up and the profitability is simultaneously going to go way up. Then you're going to start getting market saturation and then the profitability is going to come down. And if you want to keep making and selling cars, the marginal cars are going to be going to consumers at the end. Like, you know, five, 10 years after, five years after robo taxis hit saturation, most of the cars that get sold are going to get sold to consumers. They're not going to get sold to robo taxi companies because robo robo taxi companies have kind of a finite demand, and they're they're totally commercial in their in their view of how to use the vehicles. Consumers will buy a new car because they're bored of the old one, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, consumer demand yeah. will stay high for for interesting reasons. So the reason you don't want to entirely get out of the consumer business is because in the long run, the consumer business is really important. the interesting thing is like there's this middle zone where the robo taxi demand is really high and the profitability is really high and you don't want to give up your consumer business. So what's the right way to manage that, right? Because you could imagine being, you're a few years into it and you've got, uh, and you have investors calling you saying, sell more robo taxis. Why are you selling consumer cars? You only make 10% as much money on them. The robo taxis are all the money. Are. What are you, an idiot? <laughs> yeah. Do you think that this robo taxi idea is, is uh, urban or uh, national? Meaning like, if if taxis were cheap enough, would we already be there? Meaning, like, does a new, when does a New Yorker need a car or rent a car? If they're going hiking in the mountains, is that are we thinking that's a robot taxi world too, or are we thinking it's really going to be this urban logical scenario? You know, if, if I want to take a road trip to see Mount Rushmore, is that a robot taxi scenario? I, I don't know. It's just a thought experiment of going. If the cost of taxis mm -hmm. was cheap enough, would we already be at this adoption rate of not buying our own cars? It, I think there's always going to be people who want to have their own car. And there are going to be people who have a really good reason to want to have their own car. Like, you know, if you're a plumber, you've got your truck, it's got all your tools and stuff in it. Like, you're, that's not going to be a robo taxi, right? Um, there, you know, there's, and there, that's a lot of vehicles. I mean, there are a lot of people who they have their pickup truck and it's part of their work and they're going to own that vehicle. And maybe it's partly private use and whatnot. But for the Mount Rushmore trip, you know, it's nice to have your own car in a certain sense. But for a lot of people, the car they want for the Mount Rushmore trip is not the car that they want to have every day. Like right now, it's kind of hard to decouple your ski trip car 
from your everyday driver. Like most people, they don't want to go rent a truck for a ski. They want to drive their own thing. So instead of buying a nice sedan, they buy an SUV because they like to go skiing in the wintertime. Yeah. And so the SUV is dri driving the decision. So in a robo taxi world where they could get, where they could rent, you know, for the weekend or whatnot, a robo, you know, SUV or whatever, or a camper, you know, a vehicle, which is not the one you want to drive every day. Like that could be great because it would let people have the car, that it would let you it would let you just buy make your purchasing decision based on the car that you're going to use 95% of the time because for a lot of people the 2% use case drives their decision right like you 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 tow your boat 3 times a year but you get this giant pickup truck that can tow a boat right because otherwise you can't use your boat <laughs> Yeah. yeah, or even own a boat maybe without renting one. Anyway, I tease yeah. that out only because I think there's a lot of use cases to say, I really hope Tesla is still selling me a car to use in those yeah. use cases where Robo isn't right for me. And maybe at one point, the roads will be like the movies and it's just not even safe for a human to go out there because the tolerances with the future Robo world, a human couldn't do it as well. But mm -hmm. I, I, I can't see that far in, into that sort of futurist world anyway. But I, don't, yeah. it, it, I love thinking it through. I think I think what's interesting about that point you're making cuz I've been thinking I've been trying to think about this a, a lot for the last few weeks and I would love to get your input here. I think the the variety of what the market's going to demand from a transportation vehicle uh say in 10 to 20 years, I think is one of the main reasons uh, that I'm trying to think of how Tesla is going to approach this problem, because I think in the end, I think in, in uh, 20 to 50 years time, I could see a gigantic majority of transportation being autonomous in some way, shape or form. I do think it's just going to become so it cannot it's just going to make so much economic sense. Like James said, it's going to be it's going to be commoditized. Why the hell would you pay 50 cents to a dollar a mile when it's, I don't know, five cents a mile or whatever? It's just not going to make any sense. You're going to have highways and roads that are going to be be designed to uh, be able to, you know, these guys can go 150 miles an hour. I don't know. I'm just, but, but it seems like there's going to be a lot of market forces where people are going to just going to decide to end up with the autonomous vehicle. But then I'm thinking about, okay, how is Tesla going to best facilitate this sort of uh, maybe an ecosystem to, uh, to exist where you can have that variety and where my head goes to and Chuck, I would love to especially get your input on this, but obviously both of you, but I think Tesla might approach this like an airline model where Tesla would build the shell like an Airbus or a Boeing, and then fleets will be able to outfit the interior or outfit the vehicle in whatever way they please to mm. satisfy market demand. And I'd love to get both yeah. of your opinions on that because I, I believe that's how they they fix the, the problem of you're not going to have an autonomous vehicle that's going to be specific to your use case. Whereas if you do allow the fleet operators to decide how to outfit the vehicle, then boom, all of a sudden you yeah. have that solution and you outsource that completely and then you can maximize your production rate that way because it's super The OEM model makes certain uh, sense at a certain um, price point, right? You know, your average consumer, with the exception of, of, of a former president, a few other people have never bought a Boeing or an Airbus aircraft, right? You know, maybe some princes over in Saudi Arabia could could buy that. But the efficiencies that the economy of scale brings with that size aircraft does make a market mover to where you're like, oh, wait a minute, we can put 150 or to 300 people in a tube and get the uh, available seat mile down to a unit cost that is affordable to pay for all that gas we got to put in the wings and let's go. So the reason they're the size they are and the cost they are is because of the scale required to make it efficient on routes of a certain stage length. So that's like, you know, certain routes don't make sense, which is why I think companies like Joby Aviation, some of these smaller ones are going to really take over this 250 mile and shorter point to point uh, with EV, EV tall type of aircraft one day and probably in the near term. Um, but I, I also think that I want to just touch back on the point about everything is going to go. I also think that when, when a country of people listens to these arguments, most of us that talk about robo taxi ha come across as having a very urban mindset. Mm. Um, and it's a big country. And when you look at the red and the blue on our political landscape and you try to get everybody to agree on something, it's hard. And, and how you move people mm -hmm. like that can only really be done with economics and economics of scale and price points, right? And mm -hmm. ultimately, price points will change the dynamics for everyone as long as there aren't any sort of, well, only the one percenters can afford these cars and the other guys are left with everything else. I, I don't know. That, that's obviously a problem we got to deal with, too. But... I do think that, you know, I live in the South, I'm in a city, but it doesn't take me long to get out of the city. And there's a lot of people that don't think anywhere near like we're thinking 
mm. in the time frames I'm talking about through 2030. So we can go beyond that and talk futuristic and, and things can go anywhere we want to dream. Um, so anyway, that, just on, on the models like people are building. You're kind of extrapolating, you're imagining that, that like robo taxis are going to have the same constraints that Uber has from an economics kind of standpoint. Because like if you live, you know, if you visit your, your family in the country, like getting an Uber to drive you home after Thanksgiving, um, is hard, right? Like it, that's not as good a use case as if you're someplace inside a dense urban environment where there, where there are lots of, of but uh, that it's probably worth separating autonomy from the taxi kind of component of it because, you know, the cars are all going to be autonomous. And the question will just be, do you own your autonomous car and have you drive you around? Or do you rent one by the minute, by the day, by the month? You know, in, in the long run, the econ you know, the ecosystem fills out. There's, you know, we have hundreds of millions of vehicles, there are thousands of use cases, and there will be like some business model for each one of those use cases. You know, so like I said with the plumber, you know, he's going to own his own truck. He's probably not going to use a robo taxi, but it'll drive him where he's going, right? It'll still have autonomy in it because in the long run, autonomy is a cheap adder. Like we, we put headlights on cars, <laughs> right? We put headlights on all the cars because the utility of headlights is very high compared to the cost. And, and RoboTaxi is going to be like that. There just won't be cars that can't drive themselves at some point, right? Yeah. So the question agree. isn't like, I'm a farmer, you know, and I live in the boonies. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to call Uber to take me to the store to get my groceries or whatever the deal is. Maybe, you know, and the flip side is it might be that, that operating taxis in, in a rural environment is actually a, a really good business. I mean, it's a bad business. If uh, having low duty cycle on a human being that drives a car, like for the economics aren't great. Cause you, you, you know, the, you, the, the human has to make a certain base wage and he can only cover so much ground. So once the population density gets too low, but the economics of a robo taxi, they're just like the economics of a car parked in a parking lot, right? Because yeah. if the robo taxi is just in the car and it's there just like the headlights are, then it can just sit in the parking lot and wait for you, right? So, you know, robo taxis in, in rural environments might be way more popular than because I grew up in a rural environment and in rural environments, you spend a lot of time driving on really boring roads where there's nothing to see where you drive them every day. And so, you know, I, I, my sense of pe most people in that environment is they would love to be able to read a book and just have a car do its own thing. Completely yeah. agree. Yeah. I think, I think that's what the, the, the sort of tidbit around the, the real, I think the cost of ownership point was really the, the one where my head goes to automatically when we're talking about the adoption of robo taxi, if something is 50 to 80% cheaper to run, there's going to be a gigantic percentage of the population that's going to migrate to that. And sort of the, yes. the comment you made about uh, Chuck about sort of rural America might have like a different viewpoint. I think about 50% of the U S population is paycheck to paycheck. They're going to jump on this thing immediately, like regardless of where you live, like this is an automatic sort of thing that happens because if you could save, you know, if you could save a couple hundred bucks a month to be able to, you know, feed your kids or pay rent, like this is where robo taxi really becomes magical. Yeah. And I wonder, and I wonder how much that's going to sway governments to become more accepting of it, because I think a, a fair number of folks are going to be uh, almost, it's almost going to be life changing for them to have access to this sort of technology. And I don't know if you guys have thought about this, but that's where my head goes to is like, boy, as soon as the cost, the economies of scale kicks in for this thing, it's over. Like, yeah. 50, half of the country is going to be renting it. <laughs> you know? some, some points to think about on that. Like, I totally agree with all the points that, you know, there are people who are super cost sensitive and there are people who don't care. They only care about utility and they're just going to go with whatever the cheapest thing is that provides them with the utility. But, you know, in, in the United States, you can get a perfectly functional car for $20,000. Like, it's not hard. And the average car is $40,000. Like, how many people do you know who bought the cheapest car that can do the job for them? Now, there are definitely people who do it, but there's also a huge chunk of the market that doesn't want the cheapest car because mm -hmm. utility, it's not just about utility. It's also about entertainment. Like people like sporty cars. They like things that feel, that feel safe and feel comfortable. Um, they might like stuff that's quiet. They might want to ride by themselves. <laughs> you know, you can have all these other reasons why, you don't buy the cheapest car because you place value on all these other things. And a huge chunk of at least the American public, the, the OECD countries, 
people have disposable income. I mean, you're, you're going to, you know, spend some of it to go on vacation and some of it to eat out and people spend some of it to like have a nicer ride if they spend a lot of time in their car. Yeah. Interesting. I, I, I don't disagree. Um, I, I do think I want to tie your comment, Farzad, back to what James said, that my rural America comment is mostly the, the working rural. So the truck plumber mm -hmm. comment and the farmer gotcha. and, the, and the people that are towing things and horse trailers and, and the things like that, you know, I, I, the chores and the errands and the dropping kids off at school. Th those are pretty easy solutions, I think, for Robo. Uh, so maybe there's a split there. But mm -hmm. I, I got a question for James. Mm -hmm. So 30th of September. I know you and I are both hoping to go to AI Day too. You probably have a better chance of getting an invite than me, but we'll see, uh, I've already reserved a, a flight if I can get one. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I haven't made travel plans yet. We'll see. I, <laughs> I reached out and there's some hope, but I, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. So I, what do you I think mean, we're going to see? That's kind of what I wanted to tease this into. Uh, what do I think we're going to see? Well, I mean, they've said that they're going to show us Optimus, whatever the current version of Optimus is. I think, you know, we're going to see the 0 0.1 version. Uh, I think uh, my, my sense is that the foundational technologies that you want to build a really compelling robot. To me, a really compelling robot is a humanoid robot that costs 10,000 bucks that you can mass produce. And like, I'm pretty confident that that's possible to do and that that economically is a very compelling thing to do. But to get there, you know, it, you're going to need like 100 million a year kind of manufacturing volume. It, you, don't, you don't get that at the small volumes. And, you know, I mentioned the actuators. Like, there are, there are not good actuators for robots available today. Yeah. And doing a really good actuator is not, you know, it's not something where you can knock it together with some machine tools that you can get today. It's going gonna, it's gonna to require the development of some fundamental new technologies in order to get there. And they're not going to have that on Optimus One, right? So we're definitely going to see, you know, this trajectory. It, it'll be, yeah. I'm very interested to see what they do show uh, in terms of capabilities, what they emphasize to the audience and look at the mechanics of what they're building to get a sense of what, because that should tell us what they think is important what they can do in the short run. And people have speculated a lot about like, where do they use the first robots and what do they do? And then what does the second one look like? And how do you collect the data that you need to train the neural networks? And, and I think we'll get, it, we'll get glimpses at to what they're thinking by being able to kind of you know, read between the lines on the stuff that they, that they show us there. But I also, you know, I would love to hear them tell us that they've got hardware four coming out, right? I think it's about time. That's what a, I was hoping you were going to say. That's what I wanted to talk yeah. about. <laughs> it, uh, it, it seems like it's time to me to do it. Uh, it's, uh, Elon had said a while back that, that they were planning to introduce that with the Cybertruck. And then after that, the Cybertruck got pushed back. So, But originally, he was talking about it coming out right about now, um, mm -hmm. Hardware 4. So because of the lead time for for building these kinds of things because you know hardware 4 is going to be an art it, it's, it's mostly going to be a new computer but it might they might change the cameras too that's possible and uh and if they do that then uh it you know it's not the kind of thing that is easy to change your mind about and just move it by three months one one way or another uh yeah. like if they had it in the pipe and they were developing it with the expectation that they were going to release it in like third fourth quarter of this year which is what elon was talking about at first the first time you mentioned yeah. it then you know you would sort of expect it would be on that track, and we and they wouldn't be necessary. They wouldn't be waiting until next summer to push hardware four out. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm 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 expecting. <laughs> I know a lot of people are expecting more cameras. I'm not expecting more cameras on hardware four. I'm expecting the same cameras. I mean, I could imagine them going to higher res. Like you could do that if you wanted to. Um, there's some utility to it. I don't think resolution is actually an issue. We could talk about that some, why I think that. Yeah. But uh, I don't think resolution is a big issue on the current cameras. Um, I do think that they want more compute and they can get more compute, more than anything else. Like if you look at the, you know, since hardware three came out, like what, what improved the most? Like did mm -hmm. cameras or, you know, you know, cabling, other sensors, computer. Well, it's really clear. Like the, of all the stuff in the mix, the computers have gotten a lot better, a lot cheaper. The power envelope has improved. And so that's probably the place we will see the single biggest spec step, regardless of what they do with the rest of the system sensors and so forth. But just going down to five nanometer process is going to lower a lot of power consumption and offer the opportunity for, yeah. for more on one chip kind of a thing. Yeah, they, I think they, we they weren't even really that, trying right? hard. 
I mean, when yeah. they came out with the first one, it was 14 and they, you know, seven nanometer was an available process at the time they did that. Certainly 10 and 10 is quite significantly better than 14 is. Um, they had said that they went with 14 because they wanted, I think the, they, some of the IP that they bought to get. So when you make one of these socks, you don't design the whole thing from scratch. You design some parts from scratch, but a lot of it you buy as building blocks from other, or you license a piece. And then the way you receive that license, is, you can, it can be different kinds of, uh, of ways, but for these kinds of processes, typically like they might've licensed from ARM, a particular version of an ARM core, the CPU core, that was already pre-optimized for the process at the vendor they were planning to have fabricate it. And so like if they had one of those at 14 nanometer, but they didn't have one at 10, that might be why you, and th that seemed to be the implication that there's an yeah. Im important piece of IP they could only get at 14. And so that was why they went with 14. But if they really wanna push, I mean, we know that they're working with TSMC seven, right? Because that's what they're using on, in Dojo. So, you know, they got a relationship with TSMC at seven. Um, that seems like a kind of obvious place to go. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, yesterday was the big Apple announcement. I don't know if any of you watched that. You know, obviously, it's always interesting to watch that. And I, the comment you made about building a die and, and getting all the parts. Apple's done a pretty good job in showing off their Bionic series chips. And each iteration since the first uh, Apple Silicon chip came out, you know, they kind of show the diagrams. You can almost see them adding GPUs here and adding, you know, the Enclave here and adding the, you know, all the different parts. And you can kind of, I know it's not a one for one translation, but when you think of Tesla being on their version one right now and just yeah. going to version two, all of the opportunity of iteration on creating your own uh, chips and how much improvement opportunity there is. Not that you want to iterate too fast because it's expensive, but and nor is it an iPhone cycle, but I've learned a little bit in just watching the Apple presentations each year to, to ha what goes into making your own silicon and the way they describe it at, at my level anyway. Uh, so that's pretty fascinating. So I do think they're going to add higher res cameras and, and not only because I think they need them, I do think they need them, is because we got a few Samsung orders <laughs> for Tesla for 5.7 yeah. megapixel cameras that kind of say, well, maybe that's where they're going. I, you know, I don't yeah. know where else they're going to put Did them. It, what, what was the res on the rumor that you heard? 5.7, I think, megapixel. 5.7, yeah. So, you know, yeah. there's a trade-off between resolution and sensitivity, right? And having high dynamic range and good uh, good low light sensitivity is also a high priority. So you, it's, it, it's not, there's definitely this trade-off where like the higher resolution you go, the worse your low light performance is going to be at the basic physics level. And then you can compensate for some of that stuff with, uh, with sort of computational processes where you try to do, you know, you interpolate between pixels and that kind of stuff. Five meg. Yeah. 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 I mean, it'll be Going interesting to... if they go to five meg, that's going way up. I mean, yeah. the one, the one, 1 1.2 megabit, 1 1.2 megapixels with the dynamic range, because they're getting like 12 or 16 bits of dynamic range out of these things. So it's, it, I mean, why should they limit themselves to how good the human eye is? They're on the scale of the human eye right now in terms of like their ability to deal with, you know, small objects at a distance moving and you're trying to judge their movement and recognize them and that kind of stuff with the dynamic range is really helpful. I mean, there's a, there's a trade off between the dynamic range of the pixels and the number of pixels you need to do a particular thing. The better your dynamic range is, the fewer pixels you need to, to pull the same trick, which is, it's very non-intuitive for a human being because the human eye actually is pretty low dynamic range. Like we can only see like 30 shades of gray. We only get five bits of resolution. So if we look at an image that's got, um, that's a high dynamic range image, we can't actually see it, right? It doesn't look better to us, but to a camera, it actually does look better. It can take advantage of the extra stuff that we can't. So, um, yeah. So you're making the point that megapixels aren't everything, which I, I, I trust and understand, especially with the visibility and dynamic range kind of features of it. But, I am absolutely convinced the car cannot see as far as I can. Whether they display it on there or not, just the way it behaves, the decisions it makes, and things like that. I'm like, you know, the situation of like, you know, here's there's one last car, and there's nobody for miles, mm -hmm. and it decides to go right in front of that car. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. either that was bad logic, or right. you really didn't know what was behind that car, and I knew there was nothing. Situations like that make me feel I would, that I would argue that, that right now, they're just not camera limited. Like the limits that they, they have so many software limitations, like uh, they, you know, 
seeing is one thing and perceiving is another. You can like seeing an image, being able to resolve all the pixels and pull all the information and then turning it into actionable information. I definitely get the impression, like I see this right now on the lane selection stuff, right? I don't know. I the my two hours in 10, uh, 10.69 has been sort of driving around this sort of urban suburban environment that I live in running errands and that kind of stuff. And the the whole thing where, you know, as a human being, you're coming up to an intersection and you're like, I need to be in the left hand turn lane. <laughs> Why is it not moving over the left hand turn lane? It seems really, really dumb. Um, I think part of what we've got going on right now is they've switched over recently to a neural, having using a neural network to like figure out where the lanes are and make decisions about the geometry, the interconnection options that it has, uh, that it has. And my sense is that there, the spatial representation that's coming out of the neural network right now, it has a range limit on it. And that the reason they have that range limit is, is because with the current state of the software, they can only do such a big a, a map that's a certain size. And that part of what we're seeing on these this terrible link thing is they they're not pulling the map data in. They apparently on this most recent version, they started considering map data for making decisions about coming up to lanes, which implies that in the previous version they weren't because they said they added it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so the thing is, if you're approaching an intersection and all you are looking at is like, where are the curbs and where are the stripes in order to understand what your options are. But imagine that you have a horizon, like you can only see out 200 feet or 300 feet or something. Like what decision would you make? And a lot of times I see it failing. It's because the, the thing that I know is gonna happen is a little farther away than I think it's looking. And so it's just not, it's not seeing that left turn lane because the, the, the structure that's coming out of the neural network that, that they're using in the current version isn't big enough to reach that far right now. So it's got this hard limit on its yeah. ability to see that stuff. Yeah. That's a good explanation, and I don't disagree with it at all. Do you think that because it's probabilistic in nature, in its perception, what I have experienced at 52 years old can assign a 90% probability at 500 meters? The mm -hmm. car right now with its current training level and experience can only assign an 85% probability at a certain range, and it's like, that's not good enough for me yet. And we just sure. we got to get to that, that level of training one day, if the cameras truly can see it. And of course we don't have the data to know other than what we see through the dash cam and our own you know, visualization experience. Yeah, and it's, uh, humans are basically probabilistic in these kinds of perceptions too, right? That like you see something coming and, and uh, you know, is it a pickup or is it an SUV? You know, you see it way down the road. You're trying to make that kind of distinction. Or, you know, is, mm -hmm. is that a motorcycle or a pedestrian? Like it's really far away and it's close mm -hmm. to the edge of the road, right? Um, and so you have to look and think about it and then you get it, right? Because your brain mm -hmm. is like cranking up the problem, the confidence on the probability that it's assigning to motorcycle versus, and, and I, humans, will, I, there's an interesting thing about perception. Like once your mind decides it's a certain thing, even if it's wrong, that's what you see. <laughs> right. Mm. So it, yeah. It, it, uh, yeah. Cause your, so, your, your, your sense of what it should be informs the way that your brain presents it to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you said you don't think they're going to add more cameras and I don't think they need to add more, but I'm going to just say in front of everybody, again, I, I think it, in order to be superhuman, the perspective needs to be superhuman. And I think if they can make it better, they will. And I'm going to go to Moore's Law. I'm going to go to all these other sort of things. There's no reason to be static on technology and decisions you made just because unless there's an enormous cost consequence that you're not willing to, to change from mm. to, to overcome that. And, you know, whether or not it be a pillar side view mirror, repeater, or headlight, mm -hmm. I just feel that side perception of what to me in the scenarios I drive is the highest risk interaction at 90 degrees ought to have the best camera, not mm -hmm. the worst camera, and especially camera perspective. Now, you know, we can make a lot of arguments, but I, I just, so whether or not we get to robo or driverless on, on this current hardware, we can debate. I personally don't think they're gonna remove the driver in this version. Hardware four, I just feel to have perspective that's superhuman to, to take away that visibility issue in order to remove all those constraints in an unconstrained domain, meaning like we're not restricting roads, it can go on and all that sort of thing. I think it just ought to get better. And how Tesla chooses to make it better, I really don't care. Just make it better so that it gets better. And anyway, I, I wanted to kind of lead that into the I hardware think discussion. You do eventually bit. get to a world where the sensors are deep enough and you're building stuff at high enough volume that 
you know, the incremental cost of adding and and you have enough process. I mean, one one thing to keep in mind when you think because I think a lot of the debate about like adding more cameras right now, it tends to think of adding the cameras as a relatively small cost. And it it's uh, like, you know, so there's eight cameras right now. And if you add two and you keep the same computer, your system has to run like 25 percent slower. Right. Because you have to process all the cameras and they all take about the same amount of stuff. So what does that cost you like you? So you add the cameras and you gain a certain amount of safety, say, in certain situations, like the number of situations where it's totally black and white, like without the extra camera, you absolutely can't do it. As far as I can tell, those are extraordinarily rare situations. So the overall statistics of, of like how much you've increased the, you know, the capability envelope of the platform by adding two cameras. And then you have to deduct from that, like how many, how many fewer can you make because of the, because of the incremental cost or how much, how much does the 25% reduction in processing speed frame rate for the system as old, like what does that cost you? Like what, how many more accidents do you get because it's not quick enough versus the ones that you saved? Like the, you know, when, when I work the numbers, like the, the inc and then on top of this right now, it's all software limited that the, the you know, the failures, like that they're so limited by the, by failures of, of the software to do stuff it will be able to do when they get it right. Uh, like they have so many of those and they have so few problems, which basically come down to, even if the software was perfect, they couldn't do this because they don't have the hardware. Like those are mm. really small compared to the problems that they have. So where do I want them spent? I always, I want them, you know, to get, bring it to market as fast as possible, make it in a format that as many people in as many situations have access to this technology as possible, like as soon as possible. And so I want to see them like in, you know, the way the value system that I bring to this is whatever gets you there the fastest is what they should be working on, which means whatever's causing the most problems for you right now is where you yeah. focus most of your attention. And the thing, I mean, obviously if they knew, here's, you know, here's another perspective, right? The people who've spent the most time thinking about this, who've studied it the hardest, who have the most data about how the system actually performs in all these different systems, they decided on the cameras the car has right now, right? And those of us sitting outside who have a lot less data and who haven't studied the problem as much, what not like it, it takes a lot of hubris to think, well, those guys are dumb enough that me sitting here in my armchair with my sketch pad and my Google Maps has decided that that the, you know the guys yeah. that did this did and here's another thing they're still selling these right so like you would think like if a year ago like you, there is this argument you know oh they put the they they went with this sensor suite and then they discovered that it was the wrong sensor suite but they want but they're going to keep selling it for x y z reason and and that you know if you know that your sensor suite can't do it you know, if you know your hardware can't do it and cannot be upgraded to something that, that does do it, I don't think you keep selling it, <laughs> right? Because you're just digging the hole deeper and you ha it takes a certain kind of stupidity to, to, to get yourself in a worse and worse situation. Because at a minimum, they could just stop selling the software, right? They could, I mean, they could keep everything else the same uh, or they yeah. could stop, sell, you know, I mean, if you knew for sure that you weren't going to be able to do full self-driving on the car, you just sell EAP or, you know, have a level yeah. two ADAS that you think is going to be level three or something like that and sell that and say, because you're not digging your hole deeper. If you know you're wrong, that because they haven't backed off at all on pushing the system, my sense is they have not internally evaluated this thing and, and thought, oh, it can't do it. You know, the people who have the most data and who have studied the problem the hardest their external actions suggest to me that they believe that it that that it's sufficient and that and they have a better basis for for being confident in their decision than anybody external to the company does so just to uh, just I, to pick it back sorry chuck for just one second just to pick it back on that then so they then the assumption becomes and i think i've heard you say this before but the assumption becomes a current hardware gets tesla to level five is that how you're thinking about it james or yeah, do you I think do. level five is a different equation no, I think the current hardware is adequate. Humans can drive cars. And at, I think the current software is is inadequate. And it's entire, I think, you know, if I was going to start, if I was going to quibble about elements of the system, the first thing I would quibble about is the, 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 the thing that's most likely to prevent them in the hardware from being able to do it is not having enough compute. I, you know, it's... Uh, 
the first time you get something working, it takes more compute than it does when you get it optimized. But because they want to come in, they come to market as quickly as possible. They they want, to, you know, they're going to need more compute than the minimum theoretical that you might need for the thing. Like more compute is going to be better. And having the frame rate be twice as slow or not be able to, like the thing that I was talking about, like maybe it can only, you know, maybe the output from the neural network that's determining the lanes, it can't go more than 300 feet out right now because they just don't have the compute or they don't have enough memory. Like, I think that is like a hundred times more likely to be a really important limitation of the system than that, you know, the resolution of the current cameras, for instance, just to pick some other random thing to talk about or, or the radar or something you know, it isn't there. I, an interesting observation, you know, they took the radar. I, I don't know what your experience is, Chuck. Maybe you could comment on this. So my sense of the false phantom braking phenomena when you're approaching fixed obstacles, like cars at the side of the road, bridges and that kind of stuff, that it it's much lower now than it was like a year ago or it's a, you know, easy. Could you and, that point? And, but yeah, and they and they took the radar out, and it got a lot better. So you know, if more sensors was always better, then it shouldn't have gotten better when they took the radar out, right? Okay, so on the phantom braking question, the the nature of phantom braking has changed. Uh, the issues you were referring to with overpasses and the static objects yeah. definitely has gotten a lot better, a right. lot better. But tightening up the VRU sensitivity has introduced some new phantom brakings yeah. due to other other reasons. So, and and the consumers, and we are all customers. We're not engineers. Back to the hubris mm -hmm. comment you made on my address a second ago. Um, we don't know, right? So we're just out here watching what's happening, trying to guess what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I'll be the first one to admit, I don't know. I'm just talking out loud so everybody can hear what I'm. Thinking, Chuck. I thought you knew everything, man. Come on. I'm no, no, no. <laughs> I well, in my mind, I try to think through why, but I don't necessarily know, and okay. I don't know what Ashok and his team thinks. But I, I, I just cannot. And back to the person that designed the cameras was Mobileye, and they're out of eleven mm -hmm. cameras. So if you were to say the person that designed it is it was happy with it, you could argue that that point isn't static anymore. So mm -hmm. what? And, and the other thing is. In, in nothing in technology would I ever settle with what I decided then. Mm -hmm. I'm always going to take advantage of cost advantage, technology advantages, specifically on your commute, compute point. There's so much we could do with compute, but there's also opportunity to improve things. And I would also say Tesla has only had a few inflection points to adjust these things. And the last one was hardware three before FSD ever came out. And any of us drove this. So you could argue that the team was focused on completely different things when that hardware version came out, was designed and installed and committed to. Is there an opportunity of change of cameras along the way? Maybe. And I'm also not an advocate of extra cameras. I'm a better, better perspective for the cameras I have. But I know moving them is a complicated thing too. So that's why maybe a new car is the reason to do it. And maybe this dedicated robo taxi Elon mentioned in April at the Giga opening is that. Maybe it will have the perfect sensor suite for what Ashok and his team feels is, is required. But I, I just like, I, I'm not going to settle and say, I believe, hit the I believe button without some thought process around it. And I'm like, well, why wouldn't they have changed it? Well, it's hard. It's expensive. There's a lot of other reasons. Well, when's the next time we can change it? Okay, guys, let's write out this project plan. AP4, you better get it all in that basket because by mm -hmm. then our next point is AP5, which may be in 2028, 20, 2030. 20, Who knows? So those are my points on that. You know, I guess I have hubris. <laughs> well, it, you know, thinking through this stuff is fun. It, and it, uh, it's a super interesting question. Like, what's the right set of, you know, it, it, and it's not like experts don't disagree on this, right? Almost all of the industry has picked a different sensor suite than, yeah. than Tesla, right? So there are lots of smart, hardworking people who've studied the problem really hard, yeah. who believe that you really need a lot more sensors to, to do the job than than Tesla does on, on I there. do think it can all be done with vision. Elon leaked a little comment about high def and radars and important or, or nothing but high def would be important. And then there was a weird patent on a high def radar and we're like, oh, that was interesting. Wonder where they're thinking about using that. Maybe it's a semi, maybe it's got to do with backing up a trailer and mm -hmm. cyber truck with trailer mode. I don't know, what, what would we need that for? Um, and we, could, we could speculate. And then there was a leak this week with a funky little sensor. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, on Twitter with a, a red car with it had the, it's definitely a light sensor because it had two eyes and most infrared or LIDAR sensors have two eyes on it. And it was basically strapped on the re left repeater. See if you can find that far as that on the left repeater of a, of a red car. And we're all speculating yeah. what 
obviously it could be you know what am i searching for chuck i'm sorry what am i that sensor that was on the repeater camera uh that that came out this week uh, i saw uh, i saw a close-up of that and there weren't like it had those two holes but there wasn't a lens and they oh, looked wait. like they were air holes or something. This was I, like well, a, I mean, a Tesla prototype, Chuck? Or well, it was it, it had it had California yeah. manufactured plates on it, and it was yeah. obviously an engineering experiment. And and we're all mm. speculating what it was for, but it was just funny that it was strapped to the left repeater and all these sensors well, they, I know they, of. There were two photos, and one of them was up I mean, one of them was a left repeater, one was a right. So they had them on both sides of the car. Okay, yeah. Um, and most of the sensors I know that have those little circle holes is for a send receive light type of sensor. I have some infrared sensors I've played with before on Raspberry mm-hmm. Pis, and they have those same two eyes. You know, it's usually not a radar because radars are usually enclosed, and um, and cameras, of course, have a lens and you can see the lens. So I don't think it was either mm-hmm. a radar or a lens. I think it was some sort of light sensor. Could have been an ultrasonic of some sort. I don't know. Who knows what they're testing? But it's just fun to look at and go, oh, I wonder what that means. Of course, it just leads us down rabbit holes where we start speculating and it's all mm. what to do about nothing. And then, I, I, <laughs> I had this experience, this experience of being like, uh, uh, which uh, being inside a company working on a product that that yeah. people outside the company were speculating a lot about that I wasn't allowed to talk about. And I would read their speculation on sort of the Yahoo message boards about what was going on. And over the course of like the two years that I was involved in this project, they they went down a rabbit hole and then they just kept going. <laughs> right? and by the, Convincing you know, after, themselves. After 18 Convincing months, got, they were so far off the rail. Like I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody, but they were just like, they they had all of these theories about what why we yep. were doing, what, what it was that we were doing and, and nothing was remotely close. And I always, you know, I imagine the guys, you know, on the AP team, like I, I seriously doubt any of them w- have watched the videos I'm on, but I'm imagining like all this stuff I'm getting wrong every time I'm talking about this, that like I'm I'm the guy who's like way down the rabbit hole and they're looking at this like, what is he thinking? Like it's so yeah. much simpler than that. Yeah. I have a similar analogy I use uh, with pilots when we're flying in the flight deck. You know, mm-hmm. if you're flying from JFK to San Francisco and you got six hours ahead and you show up and you just meet the guy, you shake his hand or, or woman and say, hey, mm-hmm. you know, Let's go fly. And you get the flight deck and you kind of get through the chit chat. You know, where are you from? And uh, you know, let's talk about that after I finish this story. And then you get to the top of climb. And you start to say, well, what kind of hobbies do you have? And then you start to say, well, and then somebody will say something. Well, what do you think about the company doing this? And then, you know, and then, whoo, there's another comment and another comment. And six hours later, that conversation has gone into this death spiral to where everybody's out to get you and you got your pitchforks ready and uh-huh. you're going to hell as angry as you can possibly be. So there is some definitely some truth to the, the filter bubble or closed environment conversation mm. where one feeds off the other. And next thing, the brain starts to convince itself of a new reality mm. that sometimes never existed. And, you know, it's kind of, if you don't take it too seriously, because I mean, the reason we get together and have these conversations because it's fun, right? It's not changing anybody's life. So, so, you know, if there's a, if there's a fun story that we can all get into that we're all going to laugh about, then maybe, maybe that's where the the upside is anyway. It's not about being right. It's about having a good time. Speaking about fun stories. So let's look at this little Wally sensor on this repeater that you just pulled up. (laughs) Chuck, I want to step away for 30 seconds, but I'm going to let you leave this here real quick. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can you pull up the, the zoomed in one? There was a zoomed in one right next yeah. to it, or, or skip skip forward once. Yeah, that, that yeah. yeah, that one. All right. I don't know. Why would you stra- the bundle on the back of that sensor makes me think? Okay, that's got like a coax bundle in there, or something with some bandwidth. It's not just two little yeah. wires going to a sensor. Yeah. I have no idea what that blue putty is, other than maybe hiding up serial numbers or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, somebody somebody mentioned that they thought maybe it's just maybe it's a mount for something else. Like the actual sensor is gone, and there's something that's supposed to plug on top of this, and but maybe that's true. Too. I don't know. Well, it's, I, you know I, don't have cool. I, have, I have no clue what that is. Neither do I. So we're just speculating about it. But my experience, and I've played with electronics some and bought little parts that, you know, can see things and measure distance and stuff like that. And usually it's a laser rangefinder. So if you ever looked at a laser rangefinder using a golf course, or whatever, mm-hmm. you got a lens on the top and a lens on the bottom and you kind of shoot and it goes do do that sort of two lens, uh, two, two sensor yeah. sort of thing. Infrared sensors kind of have side by side sometimes and, and they, they work up each other that way. Um, and I don't know much about LIDAR, but I, I imagine that LIDAR would need some sort of, you know, 
No, it's the same thing, but just, you know, it scans, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't think that's LiDAR. I'm not, I don't want anybody to think that's what I'm saying, but I, I don't know. It was interesting. And maybe it could be some ultrasonic ground truth thing they're playing with, but I don't think that's why they would put it on the repeater if you're asking me. So uh, who knows? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, we, it's definitely you know, not we two cameras all... though, right? I'm sorry? Um, it's, it's definitely it not two cameras like... though, is it? Yeah. No. Okay. I, well, I, I shouldn't say no. I don't know, but my experience is that two, you know, symmetric lens sort of thing is some sort of light sensor usually. Um, and I think to have a lens, like you I don't have see a lens it on it. I mean, yeah. you from the reflections on the car, it looks like if there was glass in those holes, we would see, or you know, yeah. we would see, be able to see it. And it could all be Tesla rumor control going, "Hey, watch this." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna throw this out, you know. Yeah, one are we just day. to? I don't yeah, think they have the time to troll us, but if they did, man, what fun that That's would be. That's a good way to do it. <laughs> I know. That's so funny. <laughs> Oh, they did it man. for this uh, for this live stream specifically. Let's see if these guys are going to talk about this crazy thing here. Uh, <laughs> but there, there are um, manufacturer plates on it, so you can at least sort of say, yeah. "Well, you can't get those, you know, on your own." So, yeah. Yeah. The one thing that was interesting, so we were, if I can go back real quick, is we were having a, a, a really uh, cool discussion around just uh, the amount of pixels one would need for in order to make a decision as an autonomous vehicle. I just Google search just for fun. Uh, mm -hmm. How many pixels, uh, megapixels that an eye has? And million, I have, right? no, you know, uh, 576 megapixels, right? So, uh, but I don't know how correct that is. So that's why I yeah, posed no, that. James, I, I see you making a face. Uh, so, you, well, I mean, there um, there are 90 million cones. There are 90 million rods and like six million cones in the eye. So I'm not sure where. Uh, you know, yeah, it's. It, uh, so I think what to come up with this number, so you know the the pixels, the the photo sensors in your eye, they're not evenly distributed. Like you have a lot more in the center than you mm -hmm. have at the edges. And uh, so I suspect what they're doing right here is they're looking at the densest part, the middle of the fovea, and they're saying, well, if the whole field of view was at that, what would that be? And that's where they're getting. I don't doubt that's a high end number, but it's way above 1.2 and it's way above a rumored five. Uh, but then your conversation that I'm not going to disagree with because I'm not an expert and it sounds like you've done some more research on that with the, the, the depth of field and the field of view and all that sort of stuff that does adjust the actual math behind the resolution and, and depth of field and, and all of that. Um, I, you know, I, you know I use my eyes for a living and I, you know, I, I'm pretty, pretty confident about how important distance vision is and how mm -hmm. much the human brain makes basic decisions off of that distance information that gets refined as things come closer. And I just feel today at our current software version, the, mm. the, the car is driving around with 2,400 glasses on and it's just, th that's its limit. And it's having to use processing speed and compute to think really, really fast, faster than me in order to make the same decisions with less time to make them. That's how I feel. It may be wrong. Uh, it, and maybe the software just has that runway you're, you've been talking about to, to get there. I don't know. I think that the car, you know, I, the car is dumber than you are is uh, like that. I think that that's the real problem. It's not, it, I think the car, the car's eyes are better than your eyes are, um, or they're at least close in terms of their, you know, it, it has different strengths and weaknesses. So you're going to be able to find situations where like humans with eyes, they're definitely going to see things that the car can't see. But I think, mm. you know, in lots of, I mean, so because the, the the human eye, you know, you've got you have pretty good resolution in the middle and then it's terrible yeah. around the edges. Mm -hmm. So your brain is constantly scanning your eyes around and filling in the blanks. So it, when you the the stuff in the it, away from the center of your vision. So you have five degrees in the center of your field of view. So like 10 times the width of the moon or like if if you if you hold your hand out flat in front of you. Like that's yeah. how big your phobia is. So you see really well the back of your hand and then everything that's outside of that, you actually don't see nearly as well as you see the back of your hand. But you're, you know, and you know you have a blind spot too, right? Yeah. There's a there's a big chunk of your field of view where, except you can't see it right now. Yeah. Like your brain you, fills it in, yeah. Right, your brain fills it in. But your brain, it, the same trick your brain uses to fill in the blind spot, it's using to fill in all the extra pixels that are missing at the edge so you don't notice that. Yep. But the thing is, you, in order to have a good sense of everything in your environment, from time to time, you have to point the good part of your eye at it, which is why your eyes constantly have to be moving around, right? So the cameras, yeah. 
they don't have that problem. It's all fovea. Like they can see as well at the edge as they can in the center. And so that has a side effect that they don't have to move their eyes as much, right? Like the individual pixels in the camera, they get to sit locked on whatever they're pointed at as you're moving along. So when your car right. stops at, at uh, you know, at a creep line and looks, and, and looks to the side, it can simultaneously stare really hard at every single thing in the field of yeah. view that it's got. And it has a really stable, you know, it, like there could be 10 cars in the field of view and it's getting the same sort of, uh, sort of uh, capability viewing them as you get when you look at just one car and you really fixate on, uh, on it. Yeah. it. Like it's that kind of range all, of, all the yeah. way across. The other thing is I it's got that dynamic range advantage, which is, is like I said, that it's hard to get your head around exactly how that worked. But you know, here's a way of thinking about what's going on there, right? It, if you if you if you imagine a car, you're seeing it through a lens, and it's only like five or ten pixels. Now the car itself is much sharper, but you've only got these five or ten kind of blurry pixels that show you the car. Well, if the car moves slightly, what will happen is the colors of the of the pixels kind of shift right? As the, as the thing moves, like if it's moving, you know, right. If it's a black car in a white background and the car is, you know, drifting slightly pixel by pixel across, what you see is the pixels at the edge, they gradually get darker as the car comes into the pixel and they gradually get lighter. So if you had two pixels that were straddling the edge of the car, you could know exactly where the edge of the car is by just interpolating between, you know, if you got a black car and a white background, you can, you can see to less than a pixel, by looking at the color difference between the two adjacent pixels, right? So a human eye can see about 30 shades of gray, which means that, you know, in between a pixel, like you could, you have 30 different spots that the car could move and you would be able to perceive the difference in those two pixels as they shifted going, you know, from one to the other. So you can see things smaller than a pixel, like there are, it's that's kind of saying it a weird way is if you can see something that's smaller than a pixel, but if you can, you can like features of, of, of objects, your eye, your eye and your brain can locate to much less than the space between two pixels. Like the pixel resolution is not the fix, but the difference is that a computer can take the space between those two pixels and it can divide it up into a thousand gaps. Cause it's got like mm -hmm. a thousand shades of gray that it can see. And you can only see like 30. So, humans and computers, we can both go sub pixel in our ability to sort of see sharp features, but a camera with its high dynamic range, it can just go a lot finer. So if yeah. you, if your pixels were three times as far apart, but you can slice them 30 times better than a human can, then even though you have lower resolution, you get, you, you can see small features with greater precision because you've got better dynamic range. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it's a good explanation to, to argue against resolution. And, and, and I think it's great to, to talk about this out loud. I, you know, the human brain is, is amazing at what it does fill in. And we should never just assume that what we're seeing is what we're seeing. You know, the whole what is reality conversation is yeah. fascinating <laughs> to go down that path. Um, but I want to make two points. And let's see if I remember both of them in making it. One of them is about cameras. And we talked about the human eye and how amazing it is. And let's skip away from the 546 megapixel conversation. My eyes also have some pretty cool things that we need to think about how Tesla is going to solve. I got windshield wipers. <laughs> I got eyebrows, and, and I, which is basically keeping things off. And I've got the ability mm -hmm. of squinting. So mm -hmm. now you might argue squinting is probably the easiest one for a computer to solve. But I very frequently today get the error messages when the sun's right on it going completely, you know, obstructed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can't see because the sun's right in it. And it's, it's very rare, but it does seem there's a certain angle where it's like, whoa, I can't see it's disabled and, and it turns it off. And to tie into that point, I'd like you to maybe make the argument or, or discuss on my repeater view in my dash cam. And obviously I don't want to represent that as what the car sees. When I turn the blinkers on, it completely makes the images unusable at night where the blinker lights make my repeater camera oh, yeah. unreadable. And I'm like, they should be able to solve that, right? And maybe they are, but I'm just like, I can't even look at that picture and know what it is. And it seems like a computer having to deal with, with that seems silly. I don't know. What do you think about those ideas? The Yeah, I have seen, I, apparently, um, 
different cards suffer from the repeater internal reflection problem more than others do. So I don't know what the average is and if it's a big deal, hmm. but the repeater is a blinker, <laughs> right? So the card can see in between the blinks. So there's that. Okay. And is that enough? Maybe it is. I, I, it depends on what you need the repeater for at that point. Like, uh, yeah. so no, it's an interesting observation that, that um, you could do better on the optics you know, what's the cost trade off there? That might be an easy win for improving cameras. And maybe it, yeah. like maybe they do do that from version to version. Maybe they've already improved the optics to, to deal with glare. The, uh, the, kinds of, the kinds of sensors that they put in the car cameras, they don't have the, um, they, don't, they don't suffer from glare the same way a human eye suffers from glare. So their experience of, it's not that they don't suffer at all, but their experience of glare and the kinds of glare situations that cause problems for them are very different, I think. I mean, obviously you've still got light coming in, but you know, a, a camera, it can look at the sun <laughs> and mm -hmm. it can see other things in the environment at the same time. Like that's a trick that, that people can't do. Like our, our, our eyes don't self-limit. They're not, they don't protect themselves in that way. And because we have to constantly because you have a saccade on your eyes that makes it move constantly mm -hmm. that that introduces these other limitations that that the they don't know that a camera doesn't necessarily have a camera can just dim a set of pixels that happens to be in a bad spot right now and it doesn't affect the rest of the image and you can't do that trick with with uh with an eye so they they do experience glare differently the yeah it's an interesting question it but so <laughs> what do you think about the cleaning I, of the camera? I have this road I, coming home where um, I, that I commute on where like uh, two days a year, the sun sets straight down the road. It's pretty scary. Yeah. It's a super popular uh, road for people to drive back from on commuting. And there have been a number of years when I happened to be coming home at the time that the sun was setting. And you have this row of hundreds and hundreds of cars that are driving down this, this high speed road. And suddenly the, the sun is dead ahead of you. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, what do you do <laughs> in, that, yeah. in that situation? The reality is, and it's shockingly, people don't pull over to the road and wait five minutes for the sun to go yeah. down. They keep driving straight into the sun. And I think they're doing things where they're like closing their mm -hmm. eyes, trying to put the blinder down, or they're trying to drive just by looking at the bottom of the tire. I, I, of the car. I mean, people, you probably see people do that, right? You know, it's, there are a lot of things humans do, right? I, I, by the way, I want to go on the record. I think the car is better at handling sun glare than me. I'm just commenting that there are definitely times yeah. that a camera goes, whoa, I can't do this right now. And it disables FSD, which goes back to the, well, how do they solve that if we're going to have FSD work everywhere kind of a thing? Yeah, well, the smarter the car gets, the more, the better it will uh, get at making good decisions with let with some information missing, right? So we, you know, as I was saying, you know, when you when you flip your visor down because there's glare, I, you've probably had this thing. You're driving behind a car and the sun's at the right angle where the rear screen of the car is just blinding in. You have to flip the visor down because you can't look at the back of it, but you can look at the bottom half of the car. And if you yeah. you know space yourself right. Um, you can still drive reasonably safely temporarily while you do that. And so there may be a lot of things. Soft, that software can. is what you're saying. It's all software. Yeah. <laughs> Man, what what about the cleaning? Software. I don't know what the solution to cleaning is, no matter how many cameras or what you put. What do you think about yeah. cleaning in a robot taxi world? It's, you know, I, it, I think, you know, robo taxis will need to be cleaned <laughs> frequently. It, so they have heaters in the, in the, in the, in the yep. repeaters right now to keep them clean and keep moisture off uh, or frost or whatever the deal is. Yeah. Maybe you add windshield wipers or it's, I guess uh, on uh, cameras, you know, that you can do that thing where you, you have a glass plate that rotates in front of it and it has a wiper on it. So, yeah. you know, if you get gunk on it, it's self cleaning as it wrote. Maybe that has to happen. Would that be a hardware change to you? Uh, yeah, I mean, if they have to do it in order to get the yeah. in order to get the thing working, it would be. I, I was just change. joking a little bit. I, I'm, no. I'm poking at you a little bit, just going. That's a hardware change in and of itself it's, to get the robo. <laughs> all all of these things are, you know, what's what are the big problems you have right now, and what do you need to be yeah. focused on? And yeah. uh, I can. It's not difficult for me to believe that that uh, you never need to clean the cameras. That the cars will yeah. get good enough. It's you know. I, I wear uh, I wear glasses to when I yeah. when I drive and I have not cleaned my glasses in ten years. <laughs> yeah. I mean they're they're really dirty <laughs> and I can still drive. Yeah, it's, I know. I, I, 
I think the cameras can do better with dirty lenses than I can. I say that, you know, I think the cameras can see better in rain than I can because of the way they can see. There's a lot of these things that are that are better than a human. Uh, and and that makes the argument, well, how much better than a human do we need to get? And I, here's another point, if you don't mind if I keep going far as that. A lot of people yeah, just say, all we got to do is get better than a human. And I want James's opinion of it's the deviation from the mean that's, that worries me. Average is not a good way of saying now it's time. Because if you have 90% perfection and 10% catastrophic, yet it's right down the average of better than a human, mm -hmm. that's yeah. not really where we need to be to get approval. We got to get yeah, the deviations the away from the mean better, right? Tighter. And then mm -hmm. progress to say, now that we're one standard deviation away from the mean and it's better than a human, okay, now let's go talk to NHTSA and say, now we're ready. So while on average, I do think on the miles I drive, it is better than me, but there are some situations that it's really not. And mm -hmm. those are what I need to include in that average, even though most of them are better. So how do you feel about this, the, this uh, argument that like you look at, you look at the accident rate and you decide based on that. So like once the accident rate is half or a quarter or 10 times less than people, yeah. then, it, then it's ready. Does that feel like uh, yeah. right? Oh, I think accident rate, uh, well, I guess it, you know, I, I like that metric better, first of all, because it actually has a causal outcome that, that is measurable, it, not all the goods are kind of lost out of that. You only see the bads and you're just trying to move that bottom end up, which is really the ultimate goal. Um, but I, I say, if, how do you accommodate for how much the safety drivers we are creating accommodate for that and then removing it? So I, I would almost need an accident rate without a human in test vehicles to reach a certain level than an accident rate amongst FSD beta testers to reach a certain level. Because I know for a fact, I probably prevent a lot more accidents than maybe a brand new beta tester that doesn't have the experience in the operational domain that mm -hmm. I do yet. And I don't know that our averages should be compared against each other. Yeah, I would say, I don't think these statistics really um, come into play until the software, when, so at some point the software gets to a point where people, they hardly ever intervene. And uh, so you, uh, like when you can get to a point where you've solved the interventions, like people really don't need to intervene. And then you ask the question in the lack of interventions, how many, because then it's just the car. Like yeah. if the human is sitting in the seat, but they don't do, they don't interact with what's going on. Then you get a, pro now you, there's always this argument that, well, you know, until you get to a world where, where, uh, where, uh, interventions just don't happen. You can always say, well, the interventions are being cherry picked and they are to some extent, right? You know, like people won't, don't use it in situations where they know it's going to fail. And so the statistics don't actually give you an accurate uh, representation, but mm -hmm. as the system gets better, the, what we, what you see is the, the, uh, the statistics start to resemble, they don't get to the robo taxi statistics, but they start to resemble the robo taxi st statistics as interventions go to zero, you get exactly the same behavior you would get if you were, yeah. uh, if you were, uh, if you were a robo taxi. And so to some extent you can, you can look at that curve as once the system is getting good, I think we're really far away from being able to use those statistics. Well, right now you, I do, I do think, and I know a lot of people don't, see value in the, in the numbers that Tesla releases, like, that, you know, that they feel like there's not enough uh, detail about how the, the information is being collected, but, but that, you know, the raw accident rates, evaluating the system as a driver um, aid right now, I think is something that's useful to do in the interval, in the, and, you know, before we get to a point where we can start uh, talking yeah. about it as a robot taxi. Yeah. I, the large uh, law of large numbers should take over a lot of these nuances, right? If you make an assumption like you did of taking intervention, the low percentage inter intervention drives to include in the data set, and then you start to look at how many disengagements do we have. And I, I do think you can massage the data and data scientists are very good at doing that, this sort of thing to pulling out useful information out of, out of noisy data. Um, but it, it's, it's fun to talk about. I just, it, it does... I try to correct people and say, all we have to do is get better than average human. And I'm like, okay, we need to really talk in detail of what you mean by better than an average, because it's a hard number to pin down. And many people think we're already there. And I'm pretty convinced we're not there yet, but, but let's get no, there. Let's not. help it get there. Um, you know, now, if you take, if you take people out of the car, it's not even close. It's a, <laughs> it's absurdly far away from being able to get there, but you know, it's getting exponentially better. And yeah. so, you know, on, on, uh, 
I can't remember if it was Andre that tweeted this thing out, but he had, uh, you know, essentially we have exponentially many problems. Like as your capabilities go up, the, the edge cases are exponentially, the number of, ex, of, of edge cases uh, you have um, is an exponential function of how small a thing you consider an edge case. So, uh, uh, and, but the thing is your ability to deal with those, it actually grows exponentially also. And the, the net effect of those two played against one another is that the system gets better. It gets, it gets closer to a solution, whatever, wherever you draw the line, you say this, mm -hmm. these are the edge cases beyond which we don't care. There's, there's something right? Like it hitting the, if it's perfect, but it hits the speed bumps too fast, maybe you're saying, okay, we're willing to live with that, right? There, there will be some line of imperfection you're willing to tolerate. And uh, so wherever that line is, we're approaching it in linear time because, because even though that those, wherever you draw that line can make the problem exponentially more difficult. Like how many nines do you need? Like, uh, you know, nine nines is a lot smaller than five nines, right? It's a yeah. hundred thousand times smaller. So if you look at that from a linear perspective, you can say, well, man, that's a hundred thousand times harder than what we've been able to do. But because the system gets better in exponential time, also what happens is you're adding additional nines at a certain steady pace. That, that, that's sort of how the math ends up working out. So, uh, you know, you can argue about how many nines we have right now and how many nines we have to get. But but having, you know, if you have to, if we need twice as many nines as we think we do in order to get a solution, that just means it's going to take twice as long. It's not going to take, you know, 100,000 times longer to do it. So we do I get there. Eventually. Yeah, I want to clarify something you said, because if you said it accurately, then we disagree on something. Mm -hmm. um, do you truly think FSD is improving exponentially right now? I mean, it is getting better, but by no means in my experience in two years of driving it, does mm -hmm. it, it, is it exponential? It's linear with a good slope, but exponential, I'm not seeing that yet. I mean- Do you consider inflation to be exponential or linear? Or interest rates, are they exponential? Or Because you know, in, interest rates are exponential. Anything you can describe repeatedly with percentages on the same scale is an exponential process. So like the, the value of money declines exponentially. Now we- Okay, in, then we're on the flat part of the exponential curve. <laughs> that is almost the, linear. The thing is <laughs> that humans tend, we approximate slow exponentials to linear. to linear, And that, that in fact, that one of the reasons that we're really bad at extrapolating very far into the future is because a lot of natural processes, a lot of economic processes, they're fundamentally exponential. Yeah. And we approximate them linearly in the short run. So if we made a certain amount of progress in a certain area, we just double that. And we say, if it takes twice as long, we'll get there. And on exponential processes like Moore's law, say, or Wright's law, you get, you, it leads you to the wrong conclusion if you try to go very far down the road. So I will point out like Tesla, it wasn't like Tesla was, you know, a couple of years ago saying, oh, we got a 10% improvement in this and a 20% improvement. And now they're saying, oh, we got a 0.1% improvement and a 0.2% improvement. That would be linear, right? If they keep saying 10%, you okay. know, improvement in their metrics, that's exponential. Then words matter. And I think most people hear exponential and think we're on the vertical axis of that exponential curve. Oh. I don't sense that. They they, I, they they conflate uh, exponential with explosive or something like dramatic as but exponential and it, it, I mean, it's got a very strict you know uh, meaning which is that your rate of improvement relative to the previous stage is relatively complicated so like if you're if you're ten percent better than you were last time and that was ten percent better than the time before and that was ten percent better than the time before that's an exponential curve and if you plot it it'll look like this. And that's what I, when I say they're improving exponentially, that's what I mean. The, the improvement process itself is, ascent, I mean, we're talking in pretty vague terms here, but, but it is an exponential. So if you were to go inside Tesla's data and look at what they're, you know, some basic metrics like intervention rates or like how often it made an error in on this particular type of perception, that stuff. And you look at those things over time, over time. I think this is what Andre was saying is like, you look at the internal metrics and what you see is they get 10% better, 10% better, 10% better, 10% better. And you keep iterating that and whoops, and the curve looks like this, right? It, now your expectations are constantly changing too, because a year later you're used to, you know, 
it, you know, as the system gets better, our expectations go up, right? So yeah. it needs more improvement to seem this like the same amount of improvement as as it would have been like a year ago or two years ago when it was much worse. So it, it never feels exponential. <laughs> I right. think what's super interesting about this discussion is just how subjective uh, uh, and uh, how you perceive the system to be uh, doing what you think it should be doing is into the equation of actually uh, uh, quantitatively calculating how much better the system's getting, right? So I guess where my head goes to is like, Chuck, how what would need to happen for you to feel that exponential, right? Like, it's, I'm, I'm trying to like, because I think this ties into the conversation of what it means to have a system that people accept as being safe, but they don't perceive as safe, right? Or 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 usable. So what would you need to see for you to feel like that? Uh, well, first of all, I, I want to very clearly say, James and I now agree. I agree with his argument. It's just where we are on Got that it. curve may differ a little bit. Uh, you yeah, know, yeah. now I'll agree with it's an exponential curve, but where we are on the ramp, maybe we differ. I don't know. Um, it is getting really, really good at the middle part of a drive. There are very few times I can't really just trust it on a straight in city streets environment. Stoplights, turns, intersections, some lane stuff we got to work on, some mapping data we got to work on. It's it's the beginning and end that it's just really not consistent or reliable that when I start to see beginning to end of drive done, not me helping it get onto the straight road and then it getting me all the way to the parking lot and then me taking over and getting in the parking lot. When those end cases start to merge in and it all feels smooth and probably integrating into the highway mode, obviously there's a reason we're not on version on, on B11 yet is because there's some, it's not good enough to compare the heuristics yet or some reason they hadn't introduced it yet. I think that's what I'm going to see. When all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I've got nothing left to do. But right now I still have a lot to do, but it's typically in the ends of my drives. Got it. Okay. That's yeah. helpful. I, was, I wasn't sure if you had anything there to say, James, but um, that was um, answer. It, yeah. it's, I was going to, the way people are wired, things never feel exponential to us. That's why that, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. there's that, what is that? There's that Chinese, uh, fable about the guy who he asked for his, uh, he, he, he was asked, he, you know, he, he did some great thing for the kingdom and he was asked what he wanted as a reward. And he said, well, I, you know, I want, I want you, uh, you know, you get a chessboard out and I want one grain of rice on the first square and two on the second and just double the number of grains of rice as you work your way along the chessboard. Because as a human being, that doesn't seem like it's going to be a lot of rice, you know, but by the time you get to that 64th, thing like it's like a earth mass of rice yeah. like exponentials do that kind of thing they creep up oh james uh, is still there hello yeah. they he, creep up <laughs> he jumps back in i'll let him have the floor again the other thing i was going to no say problem. that in the middle of the drive some additional functionality that will help the other tools work better uh, we all like back a huge yeah you're back oh Go you're ahead. back we got you was it was that just me that disappeared <laughs> yeah 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 okay. you said uh it goes up or something and then you just yeah. freeze. Anyway, right the, there. Th this is, I think, you know, when, when you're seeing the 50% or hundred percent per period kind of rate of improvement, it looks like an exponential because you see these really big steps, but it's also an exponential if you get a steady state of smaller increases, but the increases, you know, for people who work in the Silicon industry, you know, Moore's law ex outside the chip world, like we talk about Moore's law and that kind of stuff. And people inside the world who, who, who work on the chips, they're often frequently really pissed off about talking about Moore's law because it sounds like it's just automatic and, and it goes up and you can expect this, th this stuff. And when you're working on those in, in those kinds of industries, it doesn't feel exponential. It feels like a death march, each one of the, <laughs> the next steps that's going on. Like it feels so linear, like you're never gonna get there. It's never gonna get better because that's what it's like, reality. like when you're in the moment and watching this stuff, but you step back and you look at these things from a distance and it's exponential. And the reason it's worth talking about it as an exponential is because if you take the longer view, you, and you don't model it as an exponential, think about it as an exponential rationally, like it never feels that way. But if you don't model it that way, you're going to be way off. And so like, you know, that Chinese emperor who agreed to the whole rice thing, it was a bad deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. While you were gone, I started to make a comment just to, to fill out my thought about going exponential. There's a few things in the middle of the drive that will also make me feel a lot better. The introduction of some functions that are really required to help mapping out U-turn functionality is really important, right? You know, mm -hmm. it needs to be able to perceive its drivable distance, a beam it so that it can safely make a 
a U-turn without risking a three-point turn in traffic where you can't be doing mm -hmm. that. Um, or if you do have to make a three-point turn, you have to make sure you have enough gap in the traffic to attempt it or go around somewhere else. That sort of function is almost as important to median usage that they just added in 69, I think, for basic stuff that I see today. Because a lot of people say, skip that turn. Well, the only way to skip it is to build in a U-turn somewhere and, and let the car be able to do that in a safer way than the unprotected left functionality. And then you get into the some people are saying, well, you know, the, the semi that used to jitter all next to you on the highway mode, that's about only one camera being on the beam, being able to add or adequately measure that. I, I don't know if you have an opinion, James, on do you think that calculating that distance of beam a car to make a U-turn will be hard for them when they get to working on it? Or do you think that that's a pretty easy calculation? Uh, it's... I. Okay, so my theory about the a beam thing right now is that it's at the over it's at the intersection between two cameras where you're well away from the center of both of those cameras. So this the spherical distor distortion that you get for the two cameras that overlap that zone uh, when when those cameras are corrected, you, so they remove the spherical distortion before they feed the images into the thing. The thing is, if you take two cameras that both have, you know, conventional cameras, spherical distortion, because they, they're wide field of view cameras, and then you frame correct them and you align them, the middle is terrible, <laughs> right? It's, it's really hard to get, especially if they're not perfectly calibrated and whatnot. So I think what's going on is the neural networks are having the same problem. They, they need to be able to essentially um, look at something across multiple cameras. So when you have a it, when you have a small car next to you, I, I don't know if you notice this, but uh, the bigger the vehicle is that's adjacent to you, the worse it is at guessing the distance. And it gets mm -hmm. like for big enough trucks, it's terrible. They're just jittering back and forth. But as they get smaller, it does a much better job of, of seeing them. And so... The, re the reasoning uh, for this thing goes, if you don't need to look at two cameras to see the whole vehicle, it's a lot easier to get it right than if, than if you do have to look at two cameras. Because if you have to look at two cameras, you have to deal with that spherical distortion overlap mm -hmm. and everything. Because both cameras have to be fused in order for you to get the, to be able to see the edges of this thing and get a good sense because yeah. it's not looking straight at the side of the truck when it's next to you. It's looking at the front corner. It's just looking what a human does, right? You don't look straight out your passenger window and guess how far it is to the panel. Yeah. You look at where the wheel of the truck is relative to the lane marker, right? Yeah. Or you look in your rear, you know, your side view mirror and you look, you know, at where the back of the truck is. And the, the camera has to do that same thing. It has to sort of integrate the, the sorry, the, the computer has to do the same thing. It has to integrate multiple cameras. And I feel like their, their ability to integrate multiple cameras across single objects now isn't very good. And my theory about the U-turn thing is it's a similar thing, but not with the trucks, with the curbs and the lane lines and all that kind of stuff, that it's not able to be confident in enough situations that they want to, that they want to take a shot at that right now. You know, it's yeah. funny. I, I would have, I would have thought that they did the U-turn before they did the, the median thing. Cause that seems really hard to me. <laughs> well, it, yes, I, I, I agree with you. So, you, so you I could be totally wrong. calculation yeah. seems easier if you can actually, if you can measure your drivable space of being you, and let's say it's 30 feet, and I'm making these numbers up. I don't have the turning radiuses of the different models memorized. And let's say the Model Y has a turning radius of 32 feet, then my car should not attempt that U-turn. It should say unable to complete maneuver and go around, mm -hmm. right? But if it's if it's certain it can't do it, or program in the distance required to do a three-point turn like it sort of does in park modes, we, we've demonstrated mm -hmm. it knows how to do a three-point turn. It goes up, it backs in, it, it does it a couple times. You don't want to do that in traffic of a certain speed. So, I, you know, to me, it seems simpler, but the fact they haven't done it means it's either lower on the list or maybe, and that's why I tied in that semi thing. I'm like, is that related? Is it a hard problem? And and here, I, that's why I was asking you. Is, is maybe you would easy. think that the three point, I mean, three point turns are hard for people, but you would think it would be easy for the car to do that because the car has Quickly. a really good sense of the space around it. It can look in all directions at the same time. So mm -hmm. like one of the things that I would think is like, if you're, if, if you're developing the thing and you've got the U-turn module, right? That you really don't want to deploy the U-turn module until you have the three point module in there as a backup. Cause if you get it wrong for some reason, you want to be able to correct, right? Mm -hmm. You need to be able to recover from a bad U-turn if you're going to stick it in there. Cause a certain number of them are going to fail. 
And you well, if any of Ashok's team is listening, I have a, a perfect idea of how to test this. Make the parking feature actually tolerable to people that are waiting on you. Because if I let the car park, everybody's looking at me like, you got to be kidding me. What are you doing? It's so slow. So work on that to get the quick three-point turn thing down. And if you can do a three-point turn as fast as a human, then maybe that code will apply to the U-turn scenario. <laughs> Yeah, it's. I mean, I it's. I can't see a good reason why they couldn't do the. I mean, they have the jerk limits again that they have to deal with. But the car should be able to really smoothly move. You know, alternate back yeah. and, and forth. It. I. Another sort of theory I have about limits of perception right now is that the is that the perception hasn't been good at dealing with high yaw rate maneuvers. So once your yaw rate gets very high, because the field of view of, the, of all the cameras is shifting really quickly. Like, you know, normally when you're driving straight down the road or crossing an intersection, the rate at which the that you have stuff panning across like your main camera is relatively slow. And the reason that this is important is because the perception system right now, it has time-wise depth baked into it. That is, they look at sequ sequential frames. And if some frames you're not visualizing as well, you don't have as much, you can stack the frames and you're, and you're essentially all, the accuracy of all your perceptions improves as you stack frames on it. But if your view is slewing, you don't get mm. much stacking, right? Because they're just going past. So it could yeah. be that the, that the accuracies that they get for recognizing like all the stuff they need in, the, in Beagle, that once you start slewing all the cameras, you know, so you're turning a tight turn, it may be that it just goes in the toilet at that at that point. And they haven't figured out how to overcome that right now. It's they they did talk about, you know, dealing some with higher yaw rate maneuvers in this last set of release nodes. But yeah. that, that I mean, it that's a fixable thing. Like you can think of lots of ways to go at, you know, if you had to, to specifically throw something in there to deal with. The fact that it's, I mean, the way human beings do it is our eyes fixate on something like yeah. we can't, we, if you move your eyes continuously, you can't see anything. So your yeah. eyes, they fix, they fix, they fix, yeah. they fix. That they gimbal fix. thing. we got two gimbals. we got a gimbal yeah. here. we got two gimbals in there. Yeah. yeah. Stabilization, you I guess. Your head, your head can, rot can counter rotate, right? And hold the field yeah. of view still. But the car yeah. can't do that, right? The cameras are fixed. So it could be that just that yaw is just a, a real problem for the system right now. And, and so that can be a component of the of the U-turn thing also. From the measuring drivable space thing, I want to see what your thoughts are. Have you watched any of my unmarked roads videos? I don't think so. Not recently. Okay. Anyway. I've got some videos uh, out there. And another one of my test scenarios, this is kind of narrow, but not mm -hmm. unusually narrow. There's definitely room for two cars. Uh, it doesn't have a center line in it. And uh, the car right now kind of tends to be in the middle, but it is very uncomfortable using the full drivable space to the right in order to make it comfortable for somebody to go around me. I look like a road hog to the oncoming car because of my ability in this video we're watching right now of using all of that space to the right. See how I had to, it, it stopped now. It's using stopping behavior. That one was actually a pretty good one. Usually when yeah. it stops, there's white space to the right of my car. And it's almost yeah. like there's a buffer in there. They're like, eh, I don't know where that is. There's no curb, it's grass. It's got a very yeah. solid red line, which means it thinks it knows where it is, but right now the code won't use it. Um, and it kind of is this weird, awkward human behavior. Yeah, it's, uh, so it could be that the, that the confidence figure for the position of the edge of the road is low because you've got this kind of weird, yeah, I mean, you've got grass and kind of the asphalt sort of tapering off into the grass. So yeah. you, it, it may be that they just haven't got enough training data or they haven't prioritized getting really solid numbers there. If I think the less confident it is about the location of the curb, the more, just like human beings do, you, you give yourself more space. And so yeah. if, if, if it's not able to use as much of the road as, as it can see, uh, it may be yeah. that it's just, it doesn't have enough confidence. Like it, it, you know, it has a line and it's, it's confident enough. It'll draw it for you, but it's not confident yeah. enough that it wants to drive right next to it. Yeah. It feels, it feels something. like it's a buffer. Go ahead. I want to highlight real quick. You see how right here in this frame, the car was trying to go around the stop car at, at the stop mm -hmm. sign there. Yeah. I've actually had that happen before where an unmarked car, the car is literally just trying to pull up next to the other car on the stop sign, even though there's opposing traffic coming as well. So I'm curious yeah. how much of the lack of um, uh, markings on the road is dictating that behavior as well. Like that blue line right there, I've had that. And I've just let it do this yeah. thing and it just goes up to the other car and it's like, well, so it's oh, decided shit. that car is parked. <laughs> Right. Yeah. 
Uh, but, yes, but it's actually at the stop sign. Yeah. Yeah. It's misidentifying the car as a parked car for whatever yeah. reason. On, so I agree with you, James, that it, there's a buffer right now. They're not letting it to get too close. They could probably tighten that up. There are definitely some scenarios where it's safer to go even in the grass a little bit. And I don't know how you program code into doing that without just a lot of training data. But when I get a big truck coming against me, and I think there are a few of these in some of the scenarios with the big mm -hmm. side view mirrors, and I'm where the Tesla wants to be, it's a total awkward scenario yeah. where I'm like, I got to disengage and kind of, it leaves me in the too much in the middle right now. Totally yeah, fixable. Just wanted to talk about the depth perception of beam right now, since we kind of were talking about that a second ago. Yeah. And the other thing on this drive that if you just touch on, there's about four speed bumps on these things. And it is very inconsistent on when it identifies them. And then when it does identify them, how mm -hmm. soon, and then the speed it's able to slow down to when it gets to them. I, so it's very inconsistent and I'm blaming it on lighting. I'm blaming it on all the other environmental things on, on what the camera sees on a slight little hump that's out there in the road. Yeah, it's, I, so I noticed uh, uh, in my town, there are a bunch of uh, intersections where, you know, you cross the intersection and they have the gutter, you know, the slight gutter, which is for rainwater runoff, just as you exit the intersection. And uh, so you just you can't cross the intersection at 20 miles an hour because it's got this big dip like right as you as you exit the intersection. And it's it's not great. At, it, every once in a while, it'll slow down for one. But I think it's coincidental. I mean, it's yeah. uh, I, I get pretty good behavior from where we actually have speed bumps. It seems to do more often than not. You know, I'll say like 80 percent accuracy at identifying a speed bump and slowing for it. But it doesn't seem to get those dips at all. And that makes me feel yeah. like like, you know, the occupancy map that they have for the road surface, so their road surface model right now, it's the perception, the perception associated with when the road goes down and comes up on a flat, featureless white, you know, because these are concrete. So uh, unless the lighting is really unusual, they just look like a flat white patch. And it's pretty hard to judge how deep they are. Yeah. And the car just doesn't, it doesn't detect this. You know, incidentally, for this in this uh uh, scene that we're looking at with the unmarked road that the problem it has with estimating the curb on your side of the road, it's got that problem on the other side too, and probably mm. just as bad. So when it sees the truck coming and it's trying to estimate the width of the road and understand if there's not, not enough space for the two of you to safely pass close to one another, it may yeah. be that it's erring on the side of assuming it, it like it's looking at that and it's not confident enough to, to, to see it as a two way road. Like it might be because yeah. There's a one-way road coming up to my house, the, like the street that I live on. It has a section, which is a couple hundred feet long, that runs, it basically, it has a, a drop-off on one side and a cliff on the other, and it's not wide enough for two cars to pass. And it's on a yeah. slight curve. So when you come into the neighborhood, you have to do this thing where you stop at a stop sign and you look around the curve to see if somebody, because otherwise one of you is yeah. gonna have to back up to clear the space. And amazingly, like I thought that was going to be a disaster before I got FSD. Like I had no idea how it was going to be able to do with that. And it actually functions. But I think that because it's got a wall on one side and a cliff on the other side, it knows exactly how wide that space is because it does a good job of, 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 uh, maneuvering around other vehicles in uh, oncoming. Whereas like I look at this scene that you have right here and it looks pretty simple. Like it seems like you've got plenty of space and the road is plenty wide, but the car's making poorer decisions than it makes in my case, which where the road, the lane literally is too narrow for people to pass by. Interesting. Um, I, I don't know how much time you want to go far as that. One other thing I did want to make sure I touched on, and James, if you hadn't watched them, we could talk about it too. Have you watched my uh, double green lights videos I've started doing recently? No, I saw it on the list. So there's a weird, I, there's a weird yeah. phenomena, and I totally, I think it's a software, and I agree that this unmarked roads is software too. We just tweak in the code and wondering what you think about it. So there's a scenario one, that I can one duplicate. Or round two, Chuck. Uh, round one round or two. two is good. Um, it, it's a scenario where you got double stacked green lights, and they're you know a few hundred yards apart. It as soon as it goes into the first one, watch the regen. It, now this one it doesn't do it so much because on round. Two, what I'm doing is experimenting where my speed is set. Um, mm -hmm. it, it like it, it pauses and then reaccelerates, and it's I can duplicate it. I think I did it in this video like six times. It, so it's something like it goes under one green light, it slows down, then it reaccelerates to the second green light. And a human doesn't do that. We're all just like, oh, I see two green lights, keep going. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you, can you think of a reason 
that could be so consistent. It feels here so how, not how far apart are these successive green lights? You can see them both in the camera. I, you know, I'd probably estimate 150 yards or something. Is it like watch, okay. watch right when we go under this one? Right when I go mm -hmm. under it, watch the regen. There, see that regen, and then, uh -huh. and then, and then watch it. Now it's going to speed back up. Um, not knowing exactly where. Here's another 50 mile an hour one right under the light. There's the regen. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it's going to speed. Uh, you, 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 that's the same one. This one actually had a slowing car in front of it, so that's not the best example. Um, here's a 50 mile an hour and there's regen and then re-acceleration. It's just something I notice when I'm driving. Some mm. people would call that phantom braking. It's not really phantom braking. It's just, you feel a tug and then it re-accelerates. And I'm kind of like, oh, they were both green. Why did it do that? I wonder if you can think of, uh, like, no, that's, a that's an interesting one. I mean, the, the, the lights are too. So occasionally, like I'll see intersections where like you get a fail because, there's two lights, one right after another, and they're pretty close together. And so it gets this attribution failure where you're crossing under one and it misattributes. The second one is relevant to the intersection that you're currently in because the intersections are close enough. So you can see all kinds of like, like sometimes it'll run the light, you know, cause it sees yeah. a green light just past the red light that it's supposed to be paying attention to. Or you'll see the opposite thing. Like you're stopping at a clear intersection cause it sees a red light, you know, a hundred feet down the street, which is unrelated. So what it's doing is it's misidentifying the ego light, the, the light, which is relevant to you at the spot that yeah. you're doing. But these kind of seem like they're too far apart for to be that phenomenon. It feels map database, almost like it knows there's a light there. Oh, I don't see well, it yet or something too. like that. Right. You know, it's like, and maybe these lights, I know well, I shouldn't say that because I've got another set of lights that does it. Oh, but that one's on a curve. So it's almost like maybe it goes under a green light and it's like, I know there's another light up there and it slows down till it can see it. Then when it sees it, it slows back, it speeds back up. And maybe that's exactly what it is. It's, it's the hybridization map of map data and visual data. Yeah. It, it, uh, Map data is not <laughs> great. It's, I, yeah. I worked at a company where we made our own maps for navigation. And it's a lot, I mean, map data, like the databases are unbelievably huge and they're unbelievably complicated. Like it's really hard to like do a good job of like getting all the bugs out of them. And you, you, you can see these pretty egregious bugs in the data. And that right now FSD has to be able to deal with when you've got a bug in in mm -hmm. in the data, it's like it's got to respond intelligently to that to that. And uh, there are situations where, you know, if you're the system developer, you kind of want to err on the side of caution, right? When you see yeah. something happen, and so it maybe doesn't create the best user experience, but you know, yeah. o overriding it seems too risky to do in the in the short run. Yeah. I suspect map on that one too. It just, it, it's interesting and it's fun to talk about. And I, it, and I didn't mean to make you uh, analyze on the spot. Maybe go back and watch them and see what you think if you see anything uh, with my comments in, included. There's a couple of videos there. It's kind of fun to play with. Um, yeah, cool. I, I, have a, I have a question if, if I may. I know like crazily enough, we're already at the two hour mark, which is like, <laughs> this is the fastest two hours of my life here. Um, so Elon has talked about... Um, uh, safer than a human later this year full self-driving gets pushed out to beta everybody in the fleet gets it that has full self-driving um do, so all the things we've talked about in this conversation so u-turns re resolving this the weirdness and the unmarked roads uh, do, uh, how do you see that uh uh, within the context of everyone having access that wants access to this. You, do you guys perceive that these things have to be solved? Is this an indication that they will be solved and that's going to be part of the exponential curve that we're talking about, that these things will get solved within by the end of the year so everyone who does want to use this can and they want because my fear is that if a million people get access to this and they start sort of hitting these walls and they haven't solved for the say the unmarked road where the car decides it's parked and so it goes to the right like that's i feel like that's going to create a lot of noise <laughs> so i'm assuming that if they're saying it's going to be ready by the end of the year for it to go wide fleet that these things are going to be solved but i'm curious to hear y'all's take like are you guys thinking this way or do you think this is a like this is a just a different context of how we're going to view this rollout who do you want to go first? Who wants to go first? Uh, <laughs> we'll have uh, we'll have James go first. Okay. Um, Only because it's going to be really interesting to see. Like, I I'm not expecting them to get every feature that I think is necessary for RoboTaxi done this year. 
like I haven't been expecting that. There's there are all kinds of features that you like. It's not feature complete robo taxi. Like not just the U-turns. I mean, there's zillions of things. Like it needs to be able to go into a parking garage, go up to the third floor, and park itself. You know, there's there are all kinds of corner case navigation issues that where you're going to need heuristics written for particular situations that they haven't tackled yet. And I, uh, and I don't think they're high enough on the list of priorities that they're going to get to that stuff soon. I'm not sure what Elon set means exactly when he says it's going to be safer than a human, uh, you know, as a, L2 ADAS, I mean, I think it's already safer than a human, so he's probably not talking about that. Is safer than a human? I don't, I don't, I don't know how you measure that. Could it get, you know, dramatically better between now and the end of the year? Yeah, it sure it could. Um, we don't see just to illustrate like how that could happen. There, in uh, internally, they're going to analyze what the failures are, and it, and they may have a lot of failures that they believe has a root cause in some core tech which is just not adequate, and they may have something that they've been working on for a while which they really believe that when they get it working, it's just going to be a slam dunk on a, on a range of features when, they, when, they, when they're able to roll that out. Uh, so the people inside, they're privy to the fact that they've got this thing on the back burner and it's making good progress, but it's not done yet. And if it finishes, it'll make a huge difference in the performance of the system. And so like, if I was inside the company and I knew about something like that, I might be pretty confident about coming out and saying, yeah, we're so close. Like we need this thing. And when we get it, a whole lot of problems are suddenly going to go away. Externally, you know, your experience as a user is you see it just like click, 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 you know, get, we see these incremental things. And, and after you see six months or 18 months of incremental, you just extrapolate that forward because you don't know what's, what's going on inside. When, when I had AP, uh, before FSD was out and, you know, I was driving back and forth to San Francisco, like every couple of weeks. And I would just have let a, I would have AP drive me on the five all the way up. And I knew every single place that it would fail. And, you know, over some period of time, like it'd get better and then it'd be stuck for a long time. And, you know, none of the problems seemed like they were getting any better and you feel pretty bad about it. And then they'd have a release and this whole class of problems would just disappear. And I still really like, I remember the day that they pushed the, like it's because my experience with AP, because I drove the, the grapevine is the tough part of the, of the trip. It's, it's steep. It's windy. Everybody drives 80 miles an hour on a road that should be 65. Um, the visibility, it's going up and down and side to side. There are all these things that block. And AP at the time, it just really struggled with on a lot of these curves, with being able to stay inside its lane next to big trucks and stuff like that. And they, they had a release at one point and it just like it was done. Like in, in one go, like it's every single problem on the grapevine was just slam dunk solved. And and Elon had been saying for a while, it's going to be a lot better. It's going to be a lot better. And you just hadn't seen the improvement. And, and externally, like in retrospect, I think what's going on is they had this thing they were stuck on and they were pounding away at it. And then eventually they got it. And when they got it, this whole, it was like a domino effect, just took out all these problems at once. So is there something like that for FSD? Maybe. Right. And that the, the the existence of something like that, you know, if if you cross that threshold or not cross that threshold, the outcome is really different. And if you're outside and they're banging away at this problem that they haven't been able to get through, what you see is no progress, no progress, no progress, no progress. And they, and, you know, they're not telling us what they have uh, behind the curtain. So it, is it possible? I totally believe it's possible. I don't I, I don't want to extrapolate recent past you know, rates of performance into the recent future. Over a long time, I think that's something you can safely do, but over short windows of six months or something like that, I don't think you can. So yeah, I think it's entirely possible that it could get dramatically better by the end of the year. But just like, you know, you guys, I've been watching FSD for like the last year and it's gotten a lot better, right? But it doesn't feel like, you know, if I was going to say, you know, we were we had to cover this much distance to go from where we were to RoboTaxi. It doesn't feel like we've covered halfway <laughs> to me, <laughs> right? And so as a human yeah. being, I look at that and like I, at a minimum, I want to double it. I want to linearly extrapolate it. But you know, ah, if James, you map, told me where you were on the curve. You <laughs> told me. <laughs> it's, it, uh, I, I, you know, unlike a lot of people, I, 
um, when Elon talks, he makes a lot of sense to me. Like he's my kind of people. And I feel like I have a good sense of, of the, the, you know, the, the, the way he chooses his words, whether he's saying something that he has confidence in or not. And my read of him is that he believes this. Now he could be wrong. He's been wrong, right? I mean, he's been wrong for a long time about FSD, but I do not believe that that means he's going to continue being wrong. I think it's right, and I think he's right, and the timing hasn't worked so far. He will be right. He will be right eventually. I, I, I have absolute confidence we're going to get there. Uh, my answer to this comes in several different analogies. Uh, I'm as many of you may have to worked in companies where you have programs and you have project managers and they create these tasks in these lines and they've got a perfect project plan and they associate time and tasks. And early on you approximate, but as you refine it, you get requirements, you start to develop more accurate timelines on these. I feel like we've got everything mapped out, but the program manager is being forced to squeeze the functions at the end of this program into unrealistic timelines in order to say it's going to be ready. So they may have, you know, U-turns done to one week of a task. And I'm like, eh, okay, well, the 8S drivers here in my neighborhood spent over 100 days driving this turn to get two functions of the median and the, and the creep limit. Now, great, those were huge functions. But if I'm just going to say, okay, if U-turns takes half of that time, then we've got about 50 days. So that's almost two months of time for one mm -hmm. function there. Let's say the parking lot. So I'm going to start saying, I completely agree with you that there are these amazing revelations on some drives where you're like, whoa, all of a sudden that's better. But that's in something that doesn't require a new function, at least a function that I can perceive. Maybe it's a function mm -hmm. with a network, like this new deep lane network thing they, they added that is fusing the maps and everything. It feels like it's trying to get in the right lane better, it still gets itself into trouble, but I think like, oh, wow, that's going to get a lot better faster, I think, with the way they're approaching this problem. So now I'm going to go back to my measuring stick is now going to be based on functions I think are required to meet that requirement that they're talking about. So for me to be at that level, it would be the equivalent of me getting in my car, going doo -doo, and then all the way to a destination, whether it be home, work, an airport anything like that, getting through gates, crossing railroad tracks, all of these things. I'm like, okay, so what functions are not there yet? Right now, we're not backing out of a parking lot yet, you know, a parking space. So we, it's probably going to be pretty easy to do, but they can slowly do the, the backup kind of a thing and use that, that 150 degree camera in the back to, to look carefully. Low speeds are easy to solve through software, I believe, no matter what your camera perspective is. And U-turns, another one, you know, parking garages, you know, this, this skinny gate thing is really frustrating for me right now. I'm like, you know, like a crossbar or gates that are iron bars. There's times that I'm like, I don't know if they're just not spending the time on seeing it yet, but there's some, some times that it just tries to go right through them. So some of these basics, if I'm going to get out of a gated community, I need to make sure you don't run through the gate. So let's just say we have five functions. We have five functions. And if I just gave each of them a 60 day timeline, if they were sequential. Now, if they're parallel, then we can stack them up. I can't see them making that timeline that he's, he's saying. So I'm, I'm just starting to say I don't know, that the timelines don't add up to me. I think it's all achievable, but the timelines don't add up to me yet. That's how I see it. it it's, it's really hard to, you know, be, to look at the recent past and believe that that you know it's all going to quickly come together especially because we've had a few years now where it didn't quickly come together right despite i'm sure people working hard on it um yeah. like i i really believe it's going to work and the thing i i have this uh way of talking about the thing where you know we know how fast we're getting better but a thing we haven't known is like how good do we need to be in order to crack the problem measured in error rates on detecting this object, you know, thing, things yeah. that are, that, that we can measure today, but they're actually pretty far removed from the holistic driving task. And, uh, and I think, you know, the, it, it back in 2006, you know, people in the space, 2007 at the, at the DARPA's uh, urban challenge, you know, uh, like in a single day, I feel like everybody, the whole industry went from feeling like driving self-driving cars were 50 years away to feeling like they were five years away. Like so much progress in like one year. It was like this uh, just miracle. And, uh, you know, people were stunned at, at how much stuff happened. And ever since then, you know, the people that work on the, the people who are encouraged enough by the technology to put the effort into trying to make robo taxis a thing have 
you know, felt like we were like five years away, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's almost like five years away. It's five years away. And that, and that number, you know, it has, it's been stubbornly not getting shorter as fast as, as we, as we want it to. So in a lot of ways we have underestimated the problem, but you can get at the opposite end of this too. You know, when the Wright brothers started flying, you know, people had been working on flight for a really long time and it had become sort of synonymous with the dream that shall never be achieved. And, you know, even the year that the Wright brothers started flying, you know, people didn't believe it. They didn't believe it for years. People, people would read about it in the newspaper and they, they thought it was fake news. And until they actually saw it with their own eyes, they, they didn't believe it. There were people in the, you know, in the Midwest and the U.S. that thought airplanes were like UFOs or whatnot, that it was a folktale until a barnstormer showed up in their, and took their kids for a ride. And then, they, and then they believed it. So, you know, the world does change suddenly, even when it stubbornly doesn't change for a long time. I would equate the Wright Brothers analogy to the Wright Brothers flight for FSD was the release of AP-1 and the ability of starting to, to conquer some tasks that to that point had never been done before with vision and things like that. And the evolution to autonomy is probably kind of, I don't know, you can pick your spot on the aviation timeline where we've used so many technological improvements that it's so good, so reliable that, you know, everybody will get on a plane and do it, right? I don't think we're still waiting on the Wright Brothers moment. I think that's already happened. I think we're waiting mm -hmm. till everybody will get in a car without a pilot. And it doesn't happen in many places yet. Maybe that's not the right point on the aviation timeline to compare it to. I just think there's a history from the initial technology breakthrough, which I feel we've already had, into where, hey, let's remove the driver. Hey, let's get people in the back of cars like they sit in the back of planes. And, and, mm -hmm. and where we are on that timeline, I'm not sure. I kind of feel like, I mean, if I was going to pick a Wright Brothers moment, I would say when there was an existence proof that there was a car that was a lot safer than people that you could get in and you could just and you could go places in it. And I feel like, you know, even Cruise and Waymo, even the commercial services that are out there, I feel like they still fall short of that because they're still very restricted in, in terms of like who they let ride, how many cars they operate in, the domains that they operate in. It doesn't quite feel like the magic set of ingredients that really makes where cars drive themselves is really there. Like we have a general, like, because you the, the way that Google sees or the way that Waymo sees their solution as general is that once they have a formula for making it work in a town, they just replicate like generality to them as they copy their formula to the next town over and they get that one working and, and so on. And that's a perfectly valid way to do it. But I feel like you haven't proven you can do it until you've done it a couple of times, right? So like on the second, third, fourth city that they do, that they have real, you know, large numbers of customers, like for the Waymo approach to me, that would be the Kitty Hawk. Because the thing about Kitty Hawk that I would say is really significant about that moment, right? Is that if you understood the problem that and you saw what the Wright brothers were doing, you would know that the biggest obstacle was solved. And now it was just a matter of turning the crank and it and it was all going to happen. So I guess in another way I could see, you know, other Kitty Hawk moments. But it, it feels to me like the public is, you know, even as somebody who's followed the space really clear, like I don't, I don't, I like I'm really confident that the technologies we were working on are going to get us there. But I don't feel like you know, we have the existence proof. Like it has been proven. This is the system. This is a system that can definitely do it. It like mm -hmm. not when it's better or when we're done with it, it'll do it. Like it can do it now. Like, I don't feel like we've had that moment yet. I do wonder how, um, <laughs> <laughs> I do wonder though, like coming up, uh, hey, Chuck said, that's what analogies are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I do wonder uh, how much focus completion of um, full self-driving, whatever it means within this context, will be a point of focus at AI day two. And like ha half of me thinks that I wonder if if RoboTaxi is part of that discussion to try and m maybe, maybe they want to continue to build confidence towards that future. I do think that it's going to be telling how they cover full self-driving in AI day two, if they are on track or not. That's just my gut feel. Because uh, I think if they are close, I think they'll make it a highlight. If they aren't close, it might just be like bot and maybe dojo. And maybe they'll focus on certain things. I, that's, that's what my gut tells me. Um, I don't know what you guys think about that, but that's that's sort of how I'm viewing some of, part of that event as well. But I could be I could be not focusing on the right things for those events as well. 
Uh, I hope it's 50-50. I mean, but obviously the invite or the teaser we got so far has uh, Optimus hands on it. So that's the only information we have at this point, you know, and, and I, Optimus is, is a much more solvable problem in my mind. Like we've already said this than the unconstrained operational demand of driving. You know, I, I think it's a harder problem in some scenarios other than the, than the actuators and stuff that James mentioned earlier. I think, you know, you have less regulatory requirements to pass at the end of that journey than you probably do with the car. Um, but I don't know. I, I hope it's 50-50. I would, I, it would make me happy if there was a significant amount of FSD that they were talking about. It, the, the, the whole thing about it being a recruiting event is kind of probably important to keep in mind for making accurate predictions about what they're going to do. I, I mean, it seems like, F, like, it seems to me like working on FSD technology would be a draw but maybe the robot is the thing that's really sexy and that's what they want to, I mean, uh, the more I see on Dojo, the sexier it's getting and it's starting to look really good. Looking through the hot chips stuff is, yeah. it, and then the other thing is we, we have another year of looking at what everybody else is doing, right? And we're not seeing anybody else, a competitor, right? Because one, one of the ways Dojo might not succeed it is if somebody, with deep pockets and commercial customers does their own dojo, right? They solve all the same bottlenecks. And I haven't seen that happening. So as time goes by and we see NVIDIA is continues to focus on their approach and the other players, you know, in space continue to focus on their approach, there's like more and more possibility that dojo ends up just being this huge home run in terms of like really moving the bar on being able to, uh, to train networks. And I would think that for people who do that kind of stuff, that that would be a very exciting project. Yeah. Uh, to work and it expands software. both of these projects, right? Trading for Optimus and FSD. It, it's just a training system. Um, yeah. There should be a lot of people getting excited. And oh, by the way, back to our earlier conversation, that's back to their own Silicon again and the innovations there and doing their own chip and, and, and the creativity and the electrical engineering that's going into that could be for a whole nother segment, very fascinating to, to be a part of. I thought uh, looking at Ganesh's, uh, I don't know, there was a, he did a keynote that got pub, that got stuck on YouTube that you can watch for free. The hot chips videos you can watch, but you have to like pay a $65 fee to the uh, service and in, in order to be able to watch them. But uh, the public uh, Ganesh thing, it, 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 it was interesting. The questions he got at the end when he was asked some things, I felt like, um, like he had this, he had this comment where somebody asked him like what kinds of networks was Dojo being optimized for the hardware, right? And uh, and on a lot of questions he he demurred to, to respond to that, but on this one, oh, you got it right there. It's right at the end if if you want to look for where he's talking. It's like within a uh, like two minutes of the end, he's answering some questions. I could put the uh, let me put the volume on here one second. Screen, share. Great. I don't know how to use technology, y'all. <laughs> I thought I was good with this shit. stuff. James could probably me. talk to it. <laughs> Aspects. Uh, I have the, the reason for going um, for max bandwidth is to avoid all those trade-offs that you we asked right away over, over. in terms of uh, we learn uh, as we improve, we'll constantly adapt to it. The, 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 the key thing is it's a very flexible platform. In fact, the CPUs that you saw out there can boot RTAS and do multiple things also. And one more behind the, the scenes question. Could you talk about the types of neural networks that <laughs> Tesla is working on and how they map, uh, how different neural network architectures map to the Dojo system architecture? Well, I, I cannot talk to the entire um, architectures that we use, but the ones that we have, uh, our software team has uh, published publicly are the transformer RNNs and 3D cons. Um, they are con constantly refining it. Uh, that was, uh, I would say, that was so last year. Right, <laughs> right there. there. Uh, a lot of things are changing uh, as we speak. And uh, we. So, so, that, um, so Ganesh does a couple of things. He, it, that, not just in that spot, but in a couple of spots, he makes, he makes these kind of very slight offhand uh, uh, comments 
that give you the impression that, that uh, like they're working on really significant stuff that they're not talking about at all. So when he says, you know, transformers, RNNs, uh, you know, convnets and whatnot, and then he says, and, but that was so last year or whatever, like the most recent data that we have that they actually talk to us about is that stuff. Right. And he's kind of implying, well, yeah, that's what we were working on last year. <laughs> so like, what are you working on now? <laughs> right. It's very, I mean, he's definitely dropping what is to me like this giant hint. Oh, we've got some stuff in a pipe. <laughs> right. And that's super exciting because, you know, there you you don't do that if you don't have big gains to go with those the, those significant changes that you make. Right. So it's very exciting to hear that. kind Very of stuff. cool. Yeah. Do you foresee that being part of what gets unveiled at AI Day Two? Is that your gut feel? It, uh, it, you know, the, I mean, the stuff that he was saying was kind of last year, like um, as recently as a couple months ago. Uh, Ashok was talking about this is what we're doing. So, if you know, if if what he's allowed to talk about is what they were doing twelve months ago, <laughs> right? I, I don't know. It it uh, it may be that they just don't talk about what they're. He got uh, uh, Ganesh gets asked other questions, that's more specific questions about sort of technological elements of what they're doing on Dojo, and essentially refuses to answer like lots of fairly simple questions. And and I I think that's because they really are they do have some significant tech, and they are going to keep a lid on it until. Uh, until they know they've got it locked down. Mm -hmm. um, so cool. we might not get to hear for quite a while about what's it. Google is like this too. Google developed their, the TPUs, the G, the uh, AI accelerators that they developed. We don't hear about them for two years after they've got it up at scale in there. They, they just don't like to talk about that stuff until they've completely milked it dry. I, I don't know to what extent that's what Tesla is doing, or if they just don't want people like hiring away their engineers to get to try to get access because uh, you know poaching people from competing companies is a huge thing that's going that goes on and so you're much more likely to get poached if they know who your people are i, <laughs> I think the, the biggest reason we don't hear engineers at tesla talk is because that guy's going to get stolen <laughs> right if he starts <laughs> talking out loud so they just you know they keep they try to keep that information on the on the download as much as they can and similarly what people are working on is there's there's not enough talent and there's a lot in these these you know these are people that are getting paid four or five hundred thousand dollars a year and where somebody else would be happy to hire them for twice that wow. if they got a certain technical edge so keeping your mouth shut about what you're working on is a way of not having your people and resources disappear so it may be that we just we we don't get to to hear it, but it's exciting, you know, to think about what those things are and how how much farther they already are down that curve than we know about right now. Got it. I look Makes forward sense. to it. And there's going to be a dojo too, also. And I, there were one, one of the other comments that Ganesh had was somebody asked him about the five by five tile. Like, why didn't you go to a bigger tile than that? And he had this line: "Was like, oh, we started much bigger than that, <laughs> right? Because that's a really like you look at the architecture and and uh, and like a really simple way to make it a lot better would just be to make the, the tiles a lot bigger because they one of the one of the central things about Dojo is trying to get away from the bandwidth constraints inside the system, right? So you have these super fast processors, like GPUs are really fast, but then, you know, you have another GPU on the other card and they're working together on a problem and they're talking through a straw, right? Like the bandwidth between the GPUs is tiny compared to the bandwidth inside the GPUs. So you're forced to formulate your problems such as try, you try to put as much as you can on the chip and not go off the chip. Well, so one of the key things Dojo is doing is it just obliterates that wall. Like all those chips that are set, that sit on that tile, they have an incredible, like a mind-blowingly fast connections between the two of them. Not quite as fast. It's only a factor of two drop to exit and go to the next chip. But like on a GPU, that's like a factor of a thousand, right? So GPUs are like islands in a vast ocean, whereas these are like right next to each other with lots of bridges in between them. So you can scale up a problem 
you know, across a bunch of these tiles. Well, now you got the problem that you only got five by five in a single tile. So once your problem is too big to fit on another tile, well, now you got a, a bandwidth slowdown. Now they've tried to fix that problem by having, it, I mean, they've got quite good bandwidth between the tiles also, but it's still small. It's still a significant drop between the tile that you have. So, you know, if, if you can put chips down on tiles and you've got the interconnect and it's just a mesh and you're just copying it right along, well, why not just make it twice as big? And I think the answer there is that you got power connections and heat sinks and you've got all the, you, there's all of this support infrastructure that's harder to scale up, but, and it's riskier too. The bigger you make the tile, the more other little corner case problems could potentially derail you. So, so I can imagine Ganesh going in and saying, we're going to do 64 by 64, you know, we're going to do some, you know, or 10 by 10 or whatever, you know, yeah. a much bigger number than that. And then as they, as the, you know, then the, the power supply and the thermal guys come in and they look at that and they're like, I don't know about that. I don't think we want to try that on our first go. So they, they get talked down to five by five. But so the, why is all this interesting? Because the thing is, if they make the five by five go, because the system is so modular, it's like, Blam, you can mm -hmm. round two, two is a lot faster on the first go because we've proven the concept out already. Got it. Wow. So that's, it that's just, what's so it's, exciting about it. Yeah. The architecture that's has a lot of room to run on, on Dojo if, they, if they're successful at that scale and they scale it up. And it, you know, it's an exaflop in 10 racks, which is nuts. It's a crazy, crazy huge, and, and it's purpose built for what they're doing. I, I think I, I did a, a talk about a dojo with Dave Lee and I, I sat down and I figured out what the computational efficiency of was of, of GPU clusters at working on neural network problems. And, and this is basically, you know, if your system running flat out is like a teraflop, like how much of that can you use on real world problems? And it turns out that like, if you're, if you're talking about one GPU, you can get like 20 or 30% of that. And if you're talking about a box of GPUs, we're all, they're all in the same box, you can get 10% of it. And if you talk about a rack of GPUs, you only get 5%. So once you get to the rack, you're only getting 5% of the peak because you're getting slowed down by all these interconnects, right? And Dojo doesn't scale that way. You know, they could be getting 50, 60, 80%, even Whoa. as the problem scales up. So once you get to the rack, I mean, they've got this super high clock rate wow. and they've stripped out all the bottlenecks between all the processors. So at the rack scale, it's just, they're just like, they're completely in a league of their own for solving. Now, right now, the problems that need a rack that you can't possibly decompose to smaller than a rack, there aren't that many. But Tesla, like FSD, is one of those things where, like, if you went really big on some of the things that they're working on, yeah, you you know, you would like to have a really big problem. So it becomes an it becomes just this colossal competitive mm. advantage over other people who are trying to solve it with systems that they're buying from Nvidia. Well, back to AI Day being a recruiting event. If I was an AI engineer, what you just described would be very exciting and maybe a reason to go work for Tesla. So maybe that's what Elon meant when he said we got a lot of exciting things. He was talking to the people that would get excited about having the opportunity of working on academic and higher level projects with equipment like that underneath their belt. It'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I think it was a uh, um, Pete Bannon said on the at the first AI Day that when he, they were talking to, they were trying to recruit software people into the autopilot team. And, uh, you know, he would, he would encounter people at like, you know, meetings or whatnot that would, where he said, I will my job and go work over there because I want to work on that chip that you're building, <laughs> right? That like, there's definitely people yeah. where that's a big motivator. And, and yeah. it seems to me like those are the people you want. You want people who are excited about the tech because they're going to be working 80 hours a week. They better like their job. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But guys, Tesla cool. is just a car company though. Just keep, make sure you remember that. Okay. It's just a car company. Okay. <laughs> just a car company. Uh, awesome. Chuck, did you have any other, any other uh, topics you wanted to propose? I know, and thank you so much. Yeah. Both of you, honestly, we're two and a half hours in, like this is, has been such an educational, incredible conversation for me. And, um, I just, I love, I, I wish there was more. And of course we all three of us get along really well, but there were clear disagreements where we're, you know, kind of working through mm -hmm. some things, the, the respectful nature. And, and just, I just want to commend you both and everybody <laughs> in the chat. I was been following. Like, it's been such a, con such a respectful, open, 
a debate that helped me learn so much, you know, and I, I just want to commend you both for doing such a great job leading. And it probably just felt like a conversation, but I just, I wish we had more of this, you know, on the internet. Nothing, so, res I'm, nothing I'm, but respect for both of you. Absolutely. I just like to talk likewise. out loud. <laughs> likewise. Um, did, you, did either of you guys want to, did either of you guys want to propose any other topics or questions? Um, before we wrap it up or are you guys comfy? You I, I think we covered all the things I wanted to, to ping James on. And most of it was just because he and I didn't get to talk in Austin last time we saw each other and I, and I, we needed to have a conversation. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe we'll get to do it in September. That would be a dream. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Cool. James, you good from your side? Yeah. I feel like I came to answer. I, I didn't have any topics coming in. I just, <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It, it is just a conversation. I just like having these conversations and talking to people yeah. about what's going on. I'm glad I'm super glad I finally got a chance to talk to Chuck. It, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's a and weird conversation you, to have your first conversation this way. <laughs> was, That's right. It was great meeting you and getting a chance yeah. to talk to you about this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And again, Chuck, thank you for Chuck was the one that reached out to me and he sort of dropped the idea of, hey, like, would you mind moderating uh, this discussion? And I'm like, dude, I would be more than honored. And James has been on the channel before and we had a great discussion with him. And Chuck, you've been on as well. So I feel like I have a rapport with both of you. So, yeah, I really yeah. appreciate you guys giving me the chance to uh, be part of the discussion. Thank you, everybody in the comments section for being uh, awesome and respectful and just just uh, beautiful human beings. Thank you both. I'm super excited for AI Day 2 now. Like, I'm so freaking, especially that last five, 10 minutes you dropped for us, James. That yeah. has me quite excited because I'm curious to see. I'm most interested to see your reaction, James, after AI Day 2. That's Thank what you. I'm most looking forward to. Like, forget the event. I'm just looking for your reaction. I'm I'm, I'm, what is gonna he's going to hear things we don't hear <laughs> or see things yeah. we don't see. <laughs> That's why I need. <laughs> I'm really excited to see what he says. So, but all right, everybody. We'll see you around uh, wherever you are out there in the internet. Thank you, James. Thank you, Chuck. Oh, Chuck, there was a question in the comments before we leave. Oh. Does Chuck Cook actually cook? Well, of course I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I grew up with a working mom, and I learned how to cook early. Started with grilled cheeses, and again, now it's all the way into meats and smoking and, and a little few of the finer things. Absolutely. Wow. Nice. Good to know. Good to know. All right, guys. Thank you very much. We'll see you around. Bye. And broadcast.